who made this meeting happen before we even get started. Uh, there's so many people who made it happen, including so many of you in the audience who worked so hard and putting together a, a wonderful agenda, as well of, as, of course, our colleagues at FHI 360 who helped with the logistics and travel and the testing and, and many, 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 many other pieces of the logistics uh, in making such a big meeting happen. So um, I think I got all the announcements. I think, um, right, did I? Yeah. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to now uh, introduce Mike Cohen, Mike, the co-PI of, um, of the network. I don't think Mike needs any introductions, uh, so I'm just going to hand it over to Mike, who will be giving the state of the network. Welcome, Mike. Thanks. Um, <laughs> thank you, Rob. Yeah, as, as Rafa said, we find it um, remarkable that we're physically together. And it's interesting about the mask issue and eating. She's got this idea that, you you know, and the big issue is when, you, when you're wearing a mask and you're going to eat or drink, do you raise your mask up or pull it down? I've seen, this is the big things. And I wonder, there's some psychological thing of why do some people pull their mask down and some people pull it up? And so that's a question probably the network will have to answer during the course. <laughs> so no, I don't know if NIH is going to pay for that question. But, but uh, so it's my privilege uh, to talk talk about what's, uh, what's going on uh, for the state of the network, which we always do. I'll talk for about a half an hour, and I'll try and talk at a speed that some people can understand. Um, I will say it's it, what's surprising to me, because we've been on Zoom for almost three years now, it's really kind of scary to talk to people. Um, you know, like in person, and it's very intimidating. I never realized it. On, on Zoom, nothing can go wrong except people leave, so you see the number go down. But but here, here I have to look at you and see, are you actually, am I saying anything worthwhile? So I will try <laughs> very hard. So the, as, as you may recall from all those years ago, we, we really only have four things we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to make small molecule antiviral drugs that can prevent HIV acquisition, pre-exposure prophylaxis. We're supposed to, um, at the same time, take those prophylactic agents and figure out ways to put them together with other prevention modalities for things that people might get at the same time. And what somebody, a woman at the same time might have the risk of getting HIV and pregnant or a man or a woman might have the risk of getting HIV and a sexually transmitted disease. So these are called multi-purpose multi technologies. You'll hear more about it at this meeting. In fact, you'll hear more about everything I say at this meeting. So if I, if I am confusing, it'll probably be clarified during the course of the meeting. Now, one novel alternative that COVID has really driven home is the idea of antibodies being used for pre-exposure prophylaxis. So this is a whole new thing in infectious disease. For years, we've had these things called broad neutralizing antibodies. I'll talk a little bit more about. But in the, when COVID started, this whole idea of using antibodies accelerated dramatically as we made antibodies for, to, to either prevent or treat COVID. And there's a circle of development that's so fast that this is going to change infectious disease. And lastly, you'll hear a lot at this meeting about if we develop tools in a toolbox that might prevent HIV, what's the difference if they're never deployed? If no one ever uses them, we've wasted our time. Dr. Osada will lead a lot of discussions about integrated strategies, how we have to take the tools and put them together in a package that actually prevents HIV. And this is just a summary of that idea. We develop new tools on the left-hand side in our discovery phase, and then we optimize the integration of these tools into much more complex packages that are difficult but essential if any of these tools are really going to be used properly. These are our research sites. We have 69 sites. That's a lot of sites in 14 countries. We have 24 African sites. We have four Asian sites. We have 30 uh, North American sites. And we have 11 South American sites. So this, and I believe, and I'm, I'd have to ask my friend Nero Kathy, I think every, country, every, every place in the world is represented at this meeting, which is probably worth a round of applause. That, that, that. That, that, that's probably the most amazing thing, given that the United States is so restrictive. So it's quite amazing that we're, we're representing the world at this meeting. Now, things have changed over the last two years, and I want to emphasize that the executive committee that actually tries to make decisions on behalf of the network has expanded. And I want to just mention uh, the expansion. Chris Byer has joined us. Sinead Delaney Morel, Morel has joined us. Sybil Hosek has joined us. Rafi Landovitz has joined us. Narazzo Magodi has replaced David Sirwata as WAF as an, our international partner. Um, 
Daryl Wheeler, I'll just mention, is with us, but he's become president of a university, so he might be the highest ranking person in this, uh, in this meeting. And then on the right-hand side, we, as you know, we are a, co a collaboration, a conglomeration of a leadership organization, a statistical organization, and a laboratory organization. And you'll hear from all, all of these groups over the course of the next two days. Now, um, another change we've made that's important is we've really tried to understand that we need ideas and we need best ideas we can get. So we have working groups that focus on the populations at greatest risk for acquisition of HIV, an adolescent at risk working group, a sexual and gender minority working group, a substance use working group, and a women at risk working group. Um, we have a biomedical sciences working group. We have our community and ethics working groups, which are the kind of pillars of the network. And the, we have a socio-behavioral science working group. And you'll see the chairs and the co-chairs on the right-hand side. And these groups meet uh, fairly frequently, and then we meet with them once a month. We also have a technical help, we, technical liaisons. It sounds like an IT thing, but that's not what Susan Buckbinder and Connie Kellen and Sharon Hillier, such pil uh, pillars or leaders in our community have joined us just to help us do better, you know, in essence. And I'm not sure what the word technical means there, Wafis. I mean, we may have a better term than that. So the first thing I want to talk about is new ARVs for pre-exposure prophylaxis, our, one of our, our goals. Um, and this, everybody knows, and it's quite remarkable, that we set out about 13 years ago, 12 or 13 years ago, working, helping to work with animals to see if cabotegravir would be a reasonable thing to inject and prevent uh, HIV at first in monkeys in collaboration with Marty Markowitz and David Ho and others, who then did some clinical studies. And then uh, we had um, two really remarkable successes, working with Vive and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations, our leaders of the, of the um, 083 study, uh, uh, they went on to, and, and I, you'll hear more about it this morning, so I won't to belabor it, they went on to show that, that cabotegravir injections are superior to the Truvada pills in preventing HIV in men. And then most recently, our 084 study, um, and you'll hear more about this uh, from the investigators themselves, our 084 study went on to show that, that um, Cabotegravir injections, and now we're talking about every eight weeks, single injection, um, uh, was superior to the pill Truvada in preventing the acquisition of HIV. And remarkably, so this work, this was a really hard study in the middle of COVID, and I can't tell you the excitement that transpired when the Oversight Data, Sa Data Safety Monitoring Board indicated that the study should be stopped because superiority had been achieved. And it was really quite a remarkable moment for the network and for the investigators. And as I say, you'll hear more about this. Now, it doesn't just stop. Here's the problem. It doesn't, okay, success, fantastic. That's not where it stops. We're ongoing with these studies. There's an open label extension because our highest priority is to allow all the participants to move over to cabotegravir if that's what they want to do and continue that cabotegravir until such time as the drug is available by other means. And this, this has been executed. And I, again, I think you'll hear more about the Olay open label extension studies, but that is a very high priority for us. During the open la label extension studies, we can learn more about the drug. Um, our 084 study investigators are looking very assiduously at the pharmacology of this drug in pregnant women and, and what happens during pregnancy. Because pregnant women have grave, in some parts of the world, have grave risk for acquisition of HIV. So this is really quite an important part of the extension of this study. <coughs> um, some people cannot get this injection in the buttocks, so studies are ongoing to look at this in the thigh. And then can we do more? We talked about multi-purpose technologies. Can we combine long-acting cabotegravir with a long-acting contraceptive product so that a, a, a woman, at, I don't want to call it at risk for pregnancy because pregnancy is desirable, uh, but, but how women might receive, those women who want to avoid pregnancy could take contraception and HIV prevention methods concomitantly in a multi-purpose technology. Um, and so this study, this slide just continues our, uh, exploring or emphasizing our commitment to, and this is uh, Sinead Delaney's uh, work in South Africa, but there's, and, and with Vive, it's a real commitment to better understand this product in pregnancy. Now, so now we have one long-acting product that is approved in the U.S. and we anticipate will be approved worldwide over the reasonable future and deployed worldwide. 
But the excitement that surrounds this injectable agent suggests we should have other injectable agents. And so what else might happen? So the Gilead company has made a new kind of a drug called a capsid inhibitor. The capitegravir is an integrase inhibitor that you're all very familiar with. The capsid inhibitor, brand new idea, very long half-life when, when the drug is administered subcutaneously. So the Gilead company is trying to develop these capsid inhibitors as very long-acting treatment in combination with another drug or other drugs. And they're also open to and trying to develop the drugs for prevention, where a person at risk would get the drug every six months through a subcutaneous injection. Um, and um, the studies that they're doing, there are four studies like this. We're doing two of them. They're called the PURPOSE studies, PURPOSE 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, so PURPOSE 3, or HP10102, is a phase 2 study in cisgender women led by Dr. Adam Mora. Um, and um, it is designed to, to understand whether women in the United States, who rarely get attention for prevention activities, whether women in the United States who are at highest risk for acquiring a HIV, whether they would find this desirable. So it's really a, 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 desi a product desirability study. And this study we hope to start pretty soon. And then a, a, a very similar study um, is going to, we hope, go forward in the United States in uh, people who inject drugs and use other substances. So two studies of lenacaprevir long-acting pre-exposure prophylaxis. And this is just the design. It's pretty straightforward. You're at risk, and either you, you're randomized to either to receive the oral uh, lenacaprevir um, or to have access to Truvada for prevention purposes. And then a decision, uh, uh, the notion of how assiduously people can take their Truvada pills in this setting versus will they keep coming back for these long-acting injections should answer the question of how popular this is. And I think this has outlined the visit schedule and so on and so forth on this slide. So every time we talk about this, we had a call about this yesterday, it's like, okay, you can do this for a month or two months or maybe even six months. Can't you do this for a year? Can't you? And, and also, that's one issue. Another issue is, you're using antiviral drugs. Aren't you going to ruin those drugs for people who need those drugs because they have HIV? Aren't we putting prevention in competition with treatment because resistance can occur to these drugs no matter how you use them? So there's a lot of interest in using another kind of product. And the other kind of product is a broad neutralizing antibody. And this is a complicated slide, so I'm not going to go into tremendous detail, except to say that when you first get HIV, antibodies form that try and get rid of HIV. So on the left is the virus, on the right are the initial antibodies. Those antibodies are the ones we use to tell people, are the HIV infected or not infected? But then the problem is those antibodies do not stop HIV from growing. So, and, but the virus doesn't give up and the, and the human being doesn't give up. And the human being keeps chasing the virus and chasing the virus. And it turns out that after many years, for people who have never been treated, they can make antibodies that will kill many different variants of HIV, and these are called broad neutralizing antibodies. But they're really just monoclonal antibodies. And, the, and HIV developed the HIV com science community developed the technology of how to make these monoclonal antibodies. And that's been an extremely important technology for COVID, and it's going to be very important for the entire field of infectious disease going forward. So we then partnered with the Vaccine Research Center, the, vac the, the Vaccine Trials Network, and, and the PTN in doing very large studies to prove a concept. We were not trying to make a drug. We were trying to prove a concept. And we we're trying to say, if we infused antibodies that were broad into a person um, repetitively, could we prevent HIV? How well could we prevent HIV? And um, so what happened was uh, we actually enrolled many thousand people at the sites represented here. Um, and every eight weeks, we infused these antibodies. Now, in all candor, this was one big lesson. We thought that, and I thought in all candor, that, that We'd give an infusion, and then no one would ever come back. It would be like, oh, I'm not going to sit there for an hour and get this drug in my vein. But that's not what happened. 
uh, in this very large study of I think seven, six, seven thousand people, 98 percent of the people completed all the visits and, and many of you were managing the participants. And it was really quite remarkable, the absolute commitment to this study and the interest in getting uh, this material IV. And that has had a big effect on what we've done with monoclonal antibodies in the COVID uh, era. So what happened was good news and bad news. The bad news is we didn't have this home run like we do with cabotegravir. No home run. We didn't just stop HIV. We prevented HIV about 30%, 35% of the time. We can only prevent HIV for, for the viruses that were very sensitive to the antibody. So what we learned was we were not giving enough antibody. And we were only giving one antibody. And if we were ever going to do this for developing a drug, it would have to be different. We'd have to give much more antibody, and we'd have to use a cocktail, a combination of antibodies. And uh, that's not beyond us, but it's, it's, it's the next step if we decide to develop antibodies as pre-exposure prophylaxis. The other thing we learned, and I'll just skip over this really quickly, we learned a lot of other things in this study, not all of which has been published. This, this just shows from Carolyn Williamson, our collaborator in South Africa, that over many years the, the viruses in South Africa have not become more resistant to the antibody we were using. They just retain the same sensitivity, which is potentially important to us. So if we're going to make a new product, it's got to be very broad, it's got to be very potent, people have to really like it, it's got to be very safe. Turns out these monoclonal antibodies directed against infectious diseases are very safe. A lot of times you'll see on television ads for cancer monoclonal antibodies or asthma monoclonal antibodies or skin monoclonal antibodies with warnings of all the badness they do to you. This doesn't happen with antibodies directed against infectious agents. We gave 44,000 infusions with no serious side effects. And as we worked on COVID, we gave many, many infusions. So when you direct the antibody at the virus, it's very different than when you direct it at the host. Now, there's been a lot of interest in subcutaneous administration. And this may or may not be possible because you're giving such large volumes, it's just a, high, a heavy lift. And as we learned that people really were willing to take infusions, and if we were going to give an infusion once a year, you can see that might be an attractive alternative. This is called a heat map, and red means you're killing all the viruses, and blue means you're missing a lot of viruses. And the only reason I show you this is if you look on the bottom at the red, you'll see that we come up with the idea that the cocktail of antibodies called VRC07, uh, PDGD121, and PDGM1400, that cocktail kills a lot of viruses. So a lot of our energy with the Vaccine Trials Network has been looking at that cocktail. And in that cocktail, we've added changes that make the antibodies last longer and longer. This is still proof of concept. We don't claim we're making a product, but we say it might be possible to make a product. And we're encouraged by the fact that in the COVID era, companies like Regeneron and Lilly and Glaxo made antibodies with the technologies we helped to develop. They made antibodies in six weeks, and they deployed those antibodies already, as you may know, at least in the United States and the West. So these are the studies we're doing in antibodies. Like everything else, it's too complicated to focus on. The only thing to recognize is, I don't think I have a pointer. The only thing to recognize is, is that the study called HBTN 101, that's the, that's the mother study. That's the study where we're trying to show it's safe to give three antibodies at once. And if we show it's safe to give three antibodies at once and people are interested in getting three antibodies at once, then a decision will be made, will we do a clinical trial? like the AMP trials, to prove that we can make a new PrEP agent. And that new PrEP agent would be something like this. We have other antibodies available that we're exploring, so we're not married to one set of antibodies. But for the investigators who are working on this, this is quite important to us to show that it's safe to give three antibodies at once, that the study participants are okay with three antibodies at once, and that when we take the blood from people who've gotten three antibodies at once, it kills all the HIV we can find. And then that would lead us to another clinical study. We're also working with the Rockefeller, and, and this is maybe, this is really pretty brand new. In collaboration with the ACTG, and uh, Dr. Ian Sane is here today, I think in part because of, of this study that, that we're starting to work on. In, in collaboration with the ACTG and the VTN, we're exploring, can the antibodies called 3BNC117LS and 101074LS, can these antibodies also be developed as pre-exposure prophylaxis? Dr. Nuzenswag and Marina Kosky, 
who developed these, these, uh, these antibodies have been working on this a long time, and this is a new collaboration for us, so we're quite excited about it. I won't go into the details of how, what we're planning on doing. Uh, there's both treatment parts and prevention parts anticipated, and as I said, Dr. Sane is here at this meeting, and he's tall and blonde. Feel free to walk up to him and ask him about this study. If you see, he's taller than the rest of us and he's blonder than the rest of us. So he's probably really identifiable if he's in this room. I could probably see, you probably see him. Multi-purpose technologies, you're going to hear more about. I've already told you what the idea is. Why do one thing when you can do several things at the same time? And our most, and, and so market research has been done that suggests women really want this. If they can get more for less, more things going on for one activity, why not do it? So they really want this. And uh, Sharon Hillier and others have worked a long time, and Lisa Haddad's with us today, they've worked a long time on the idea of a big pill. And, I, and I, unfortunately, I use the word big kind of realistically because to put these two things together, birth control, oral contraception, and Truvada in one pill, the pill becomes pretty big. On the other hand, the pill would give you daily Truvada, and it would give you birth con oral birth control. And um, we are planning a study in collaboration with a company called Viatris. Uh, they're making this drug right now. Investigators will talk about this at this meeting, about the study. We're very excited about it. This would be the first multipurpose technology available to us through this network, and it's, it's really quite an exciting study. And you'll see the blister pack is interesting as well. And um, it, what's interesting, again, is market research. It's estimated that if you were trying to ask women to use pre-exposure prophylaxis as a pill, you might have modest success. But if you combine a birth control pill and a pre-exposure prophylaxis pill, a huge increase in usage would go up. And then what we would look at is adherence. But we think that if you're on, that birth control is a great incentive to adherence way beyond uh, um, uh, the, the, the prevent, uh, uh, PrEP itself. And it's also probably destigmatizing because women take birth control pills. So this is a pretty exciting project. I know Dr. Haddad is going to talk about it. Is that correct, Wafa? She has a, she's on the program on Wednesday, okay. Integrated strategies, this is where kind of the rubber meets the road, okay? Where we try and put all this stuff together, it takes, you have to be fearless to do this because, it, you know, making magic bullets is, is great. You know, let me make penicillin or let me make a, a new antibiotic. But to actually deploy the stuff is much harder. So the integrated strategies involved are biomedical interventions, structural interventions, which like the seatbelt idea, and then behavioral interventions, and other lots of other features that would be necessary for the proper deployment of, of, of a new agent. So let us propose that we want a lot more people to use cabotegravir. We don't think it can happen unless we lower a lot of barriers to the use of this drug. So we have several integrated strategy studies going on. Uh, I'm not going to belabor and go into great detail. HPT-091, um, uh, the design is shown there for transgender women. Uh, that study is moving along and, and is going to be completed in some reasonable period of time. And it's looking at provision of a lot of complementary services that would make it easier for people, uh, transgender uh, women, make it easier for them to receive HIV prevention services mixed together, blended together with many other things that are necessary to have a healthy and happy life. And the study, as I said, is ongoing and moving forward. Um, HB 10094 is, is a study that is in collaboration with the National Institute of, of, of Drug Abuse, uh, NIDA. Um, and uh, this is a very exciting study, too, because it's got this unique feature of mobile vans. And so the investigators leading the study um, ha have the the NIH helped to build and, and develop vans that could go to neighborhoods or places where a variety of services could be delivered at once, services appropriate to helping people uh, do better with substance abuse as well as pre-exposure prophylaxis, and also uh, services available to people who are already HIV infected. So for this particular study, it's agnostic to your status, HIV positive, HIV negative. The van is there to try and help you. There's a lot of excitement about this, and, and this study has been going well, particularly well. And then lastly, Probably in all candor, the biggest study um, is being directed by investigators who are here at this meeting. Um, 
and it tries to embrace a U.S. aspiration. And the U.S. aspiration that started, I guess, in the uh, Trump administration, or maybe a little before, was getting to zero or end of AIDS. And the idea was that the U.S., which has about 60 or 70,000 cases of HIV every year, um, about 66% in, in, in African-American men, most of whom live in the southern United States, that instead of just endlessly going on and trying not to really solve this problem, that all hands on deck would then commit themselves to getting to zero, um, and especially in, in minority MSM in the southern United States. And so a very large study has been proposed called HPTN 096, which is in its vanguard or pilot phase, that would look at a community randomized study that would look at a combination of, of many strategies in the light blue of, of looking at the kind of barriers, and I think there's, uh, I don't know if I, I may don't have the slide I wanted, of the barriers, um, of, the, of the barriers to, um, to uh, uh, success, and, and in the end of the day, success is demonstrated by providing all these tools to get uh, people who participate in these communities to viral suppression and um, uptake of, of pre-exposure prophylaxis, especially the newer pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, just to end, community engagement has been critical at every possible level. There's just no way, unless people are al both altruistic and generous with their time and interested in helping, and we, we have had nothing but terrific success in having community support um, for, for many, many years, and we can't say enough about that because you, you just can't do this unless you have that support. We understand that some of us are, that getting older is just, I don't know how you can avoid getting older. I mean, well, there is a way to avoid it, but it's very difficult to avoid. It's not pleasant to avoid getting older. And as we get older, um, maybe we're not as smart, and also we, we have to recognize that we need younger people. So the scholars program, we have a very large scholars program, which is summarized here. It's been a terrific program led by investigators in our network, um, and the scholars have been terrifically successful, and that, that program is vibrant and continuing, and this is this year's scholars. We understand that we're working in a place where there are a lot of ethical dilemmas. Almost every study we do has a, some question, is what we're doing ethical? We have a terrific ethics working group and they have a new guidance document that has um, been made available in 2021. And this is just referring you to that guidance document. Dr. Sugarman, who leads that effort, is here. Uh, I'm sure he'd be glad to talk about anything in this document. It's been heavily discussed by many, many groups. And it's really, again, one of the pillars of our, of our network is having uh, access to this. Um, I want to say two things about COVID. One, I want to th make the point that, that all the efforts of COVID would have been impossible except for the 30 years of work that went into HIV. And there's nothing that was done in COVID that didn't come from the HIV field, um, and um, that, that's for sure. Second, I want to thank the, the networks were somehow able to do two things. They kept all of our studies going. They completed really important studies at their own personal health risk, as well as the risk, and, and the studies participants obviously made huge contribution. And um, in addition, they then also worked on COVID and developed COVID vaccines and COVID monoclonal antibodies and COVID pills. So I, I don't know what more you can say that people couldn't have worked harder for the last two years, and I want to thank them. This article just gets at that point. This article by Dr. El Sadr makes a similar point that, and I, that I'll reemphasize that, that HIV informed everything we do in COVID. It took us 20 or 30 years to do what we've done in HIV. It took us 20 months to work on COVID. That could not have happened without what all the people in this room have done in, in HIV research over their lifetimes. So to end, let me just thank the study participants, the investigators, the staff, our community groups, our collaborators, and our funders. We have a lot of funders. We're a little bit unusual in networks. Uh, because we have many NIH institutes that help fund us. The, the funders are shown on this slide. Like WAFA, I want to thank you. I want to first wish you a safe meeting uh, with the rules we've kind of, the rules of the, the ideas we put into place for safety. Uh, we really need to follow them. We really want to thank you for coming. We know it's a big hassle, those coming from out of the country. 
there's a lot of restrictions in getting into our country. There's a lot of restrictions in getting out of our country. <laughs> so we, we, you're in, it's like Hotel California. You know, you, some of you are going to be, but we really appreciate you being here. It, it, it is, um, it's, as I said, it's intimidating to talk and wear clothes giving a lecture. Um, but but uh, we really, first time in a long time I've had all this many clothes on. Um, so <laughs> for, those, for those I've seen on Zoom, let me assure you, <laughs> and let me assure you I was comfortable. Um, <laughs> so having said that, having said that, I really hope this is a, the terrific meeting we anticipate. I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you. All I've done is summarize what you've done. So thank you. And here's your mask. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Mike, uh, for presenting very quickly a lot of work that's been done by everybody in this room and around the world, so thank you. Uh, I think we'll move now to two sessions that are going to focus, each is going to focus on one of the pivotal areas of work for the uh, HPTN. And uh, the first one is going to be focusing on long-acting biomedical interventions uh, for pre-exposure prophylaxis. As I'm I'd like to invite the individuals who are going to be um, on this panel to please come up while I'm introducing Mitch. <laughs> so, um, so as as I mentioned, this is focusing on long-acting interven uh, interventions for PrEP. And as you know, of course, the HPTN has been very engaged in. Yes, please. Uh, very involved in this area of work, and I'm going to introduce very briefly uh, the, our moderator uh, for the session, uh, Mitch Warren, uh, of course known to um, almost everyone here in this room. And Mitch is the executive director of AVAC, and this is an organization uh, that uses education policy and policy analysis and also advocacy communications and many, many other activities, uh, both locally and globally, uh, with the purpose, of course, of advancing um, uh, HIV research and especially HIV prevention. And uh, he has served in many, many different uh, roles before this, all of them at a uh, very high level to uh, continuing his, uh, this effort to advance uh, research on HIV prevention. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Mitch, and I think Mitch will then introduce um, all of the uh, panel members, the panelists, um, and uh, hand it over to you, Mitch. That sounds great. Go for it. All right. I have the same problem. I don't know about Mike, really. I'm never going to get on Zoom with Mike again. I'm just going to tell you that right now. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. That's the second time I've heard you present in a month, and both times um, I get increasingly nervous. I'm also, I tried to drink my coffee um, while you were speaking, and I realized why no one really puts their mask up, because then you actually can't see anything. So I'm sure everyone goes down. Um, but I want to thank you, Wafa and Mike. And let me just say what a pleasure it is um, to be invited in to the HPTN um, always. It's great to partner with the PTN and to be invited here, but particularly at this meeting, uh, because as uh, Mike said at the beginning, I mean, it's the first time you all have come together as a network with remarkable results, which we'll talk a bit about some of them today. And I just want to start by um, thanking the network and, and certainly Rafi and, and Beatrice and Sinead and Mina um, for, and all of you at the site level, for two remarkable efficacy trials that you all haven't had a chance to celebrate results together, um, which is devastating not to be able, uh, in the midst of multiple pandemics, um, not to celebrate is one of the most challenging things I think we've all had. Um, so um, it's probably the, the right way to start um, this session by first and foremost acknowledging the entire teams of 083 and 084 um, who are here and online um, for remarkable work. The good news is you won't see any slides in this session. Not that mics weren't great, but um, no slides. It's a conversation that we're going to use about 20 or 25 minutes with the four panelists that I'll introduce in just a second. We're going to try to keep it pretty free-flowing, and then there'll be questions from both um, online and, and please come to the microphones. Um, I don't think Rafi or Sinead need any introduction um, uh, as, as the leaders of two pivotal studies of the network, uh, but I'll also um, introduce the other two panelists further down to my left. Um, um, the first is Maggie um, Schwernogorski from Vive Healthcare. 
Um, Maggie leads the implementation science work, and I've had the great privilege of working with Maggie the last four years in thinking about what implementation science might look like if HPTN in 083 and 084 had positive results. And now um, the rubber truly hits the road, and you'll hear a bit about that from Maggie. Um, and next up, and again, as Mike said, um, we never, we never, never, never will imagine a single prevention option. So we have condoms, male and female. We have the vaginal ring. We have cabotegravir now. Um, we have oral prep. Uh, but it doesn't mean we're done. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Mopli Das from Gilead Sciences. And you heard a bit about two studies in partnership with you all. Um, and and uh, I've also had the great pleasure of working with Mopli, who has been leading um, their HIV prevention work for a number of years, was involved in the DISCOVER trial, and is now leading um, the, the program that you'll hear about from the PURPOSE study looking at Lena Kapavir. Um, so that's the four of them. I'm not going to get into their full bios, but um, you can find them afterwards if you need to know more. Um, but I'm going to start, actually, with, with both Rafi and Sinead, and, you know, we, we've talked a lot about um, the efficacy trials. Um, they've been published. Congratulations. Um, they have led to at least one um, regulatory approval, and we hope many more to follow. Um, but as Mike said, you both are now leading these studies moving into the open label phase. And I wonder if you could both spend just a minute or two talking about um, what the opportunities have been, but also the challenges of that transition into open label extension. And what are you learning that maybe is different from what you might have imagined coming out of the, the blinded phase of the trial? So uh, I'll, I'll lead off and then hand over to Sinead. Um, so in 083, um, the overwhelming majority of the 083 sites have successfully transitioned to the open label extension. We do are still working at six of our sites to uh, get regulatory approvals in place to complete that transition. I think what we've learned the most is that people are very excited to stay on open label cavotegravir. Um, and in the, uh, the open label extension, we've made the oral lead-in that precedes the injections um, in the randomized study. It was a five-week oral lead-in um, optional. Um, and that was because, number one, there doesn't appear to be uh, any safety signal that is being sieved out or, or, or uh, pr prophylaxed against with that oral lead-in. And when you uh, have a population who may uh, or uh, who may be challenged by taking pills, to ask them to take a month of pills is sort of counterintuitive and might be a period of vulnerability. Um, we did in 083 have three HIV acquisitions during the oral lead-in period, suggesting that that might be in fact a period of vulnerability. So we've made that optional. I think what's been surprising to us in the open label extension um, is about 30% of the people transitioning into the OLA have wanted that oral lead-in even when it's optional. I think we were surprised at that. It is quite variable across regions, um, so there are likely uh, differences in sort of philosophic approaches to it. Um, and I suspect it's maybe also driven by investigator at site's comfortability with that assessment of risk and benefit. And so I would love to hear more from the investigators of record and the site staff as we, as we think about that. We're also using um, RNA screening as part of the screening algorithm mm -hmm. for HIV at every visit going forward. That was out of observations. I think everyone who was involved in 083 and 084 has seen that conventional HIV diagnostics appear to be muted or delayed in their reactivity in the context of these long-acting PrEP breakthroughs, although they're extremely rare. And the, the, this is not with an intent that globally HIV RNA screening should be obligatory for the use of cabotegravir, but an opportunity within a research context to evaluate its performance and see if we can find infections earlier and what the implications are of finding those infections earlier in terms of potential to avoid resistance to integrase inhibitors, cabotegravir, and potentially the class. So that's sort of where we are with the 083 OLA, and I'll let Sinead talk about where the 084 study is and what she's found so far. Thanks, Rafi. Um, so we started transitioning participants into the open label extension in January of this year. We have 19 of the 20 084 sites activated for the open label extension, and we hope the remaining site will be activated in July. Um, 
And it, it's really been um, great to see the open label extension. Uh, overall, about just under 80% of participants have chosen CAB. It's interesting that the majority of CAB participants have stayed on CAB, but some have opted to go to Truvada for a variety of reasons. Uh, and then about sort of two thirds of the Truvada group have opted for CAB. Uh, and I think it tells us um, an important um, point about choice, which is that you know there are going to be people who are still going to choose uh, Truvada. There are going to be people who are going to choose uh, options that are going to fit in with their lifestyle. We know that in, in the 084 population, many people, particularly those people who were sort of very busy and sort of had difficulty with taking pills every day, will have chosen an injection. But you know, kind of, it, I think sort of the idea that there are going to be uh, uh, pre prep options for for people that fit into their lifestyle at different times of their life is we're starting to see that choice. Interestingly, in 084, we're seeing uh, an even lower demand for the oral lead-in. Um, um, I don't. I, I think that's maybe not surprising given um, sort of the population that we're working with, uh, and. I think sort of the other thing we're learning is that the open label extension is a lot more like the real world. It's not like a trial where everyone kind of starts at the same baseline. We're transitioning people who are pregnant. We're transitioning people who've had a sort of previous adverse event. So I think the site teams are working really hard with sort of making decisions about how to uh, move people onto cabotegravir. But those lessons are incredibly rich for as we go into implementation because it's a lot more about what do you do when someone comes to you and says, I'd like to start cabotegravir? Um, so it's been a, a sort of a, a really interesting and exciting time. And then I think sort of the, the obvious new thing that we're doing is uh, I mentioned that we're transitioning people who are pregnant. So having the opportunity to offer women the, the chance to continue active dosing during pregnancy. And there are people who are choosing that option. And so we're really excited about the sub-study that will um, hopefully generate additional safety and pharmacology data in the use of CAB during pregnancy so that that can really uh, remove barriers to, to use in that population further down the line. Great. Sinead, thank you so much and for all of that, for both of you. Um, and just want to pick up on, on what you said, but both of you described, and, and that the open labels provide this remarkable opportunity to understand choice. And it's really only the second time that I'm aware of um, when the Microbicide Trials Network did the REACH study looking at oral prep in the vaginal ring and now in the open label extensions to really understand what happens in choice. And, and Sinead and the team, just congratulations, because we know that in oral prep programs, the delays of helping people who are pregnant or breastfeeding get on to oral prep really delayed programs. And so the fact that you're answering that um, is, is just terrific. And that really moves over maybe, um, I'll, I'll shift over to Maggie. Um, and Maggie, clearly the efficacy trials demonstrate both methods are safe and effective, and that's incredibly important. But it doesn't stop with efficacy trials. And at Vive, you're leading the implementation science work. And I wonder if you can give just a quick snapshot of the implementation science agenda and the thinking behind translating the results of, of the trials. And I will just say, if everyone can get into the microphone um, so people virtually can hear. Yeah. No, thanks, Mitchell. And first of all, I do want to just spend one second to just talk about the excellent efficacy data, right, from 083 and 084. And that couldn't have happened without all the work of all the people here in the room. So I just want to say thank you and huge applause. Um, but as you said, Mitchell, efficacy data alone is not the only thing that we need to make sure that this is successful for people globally, right? We need to understand how is this going to work in the world. And we know that long-acting injectables is a, an important paradigm switch in how HIV prevention is going to be delivered. And it needs to be thoughtful and strategic in how we do that. And that's what we're trying to do um, at Vive in the next step. We're trying to complement the excellent clinical efficacy data with really outstanding implementation science data as well. So what we're thinking of and our strategy moving forward is um, kind of grounded in three basic principles. One is that implementation research will be done in collaboration and partnership with all of you out there, with um, ministries of health, with civil society, with donors, with global stakeholders. Um, it really is a partnership. We need to all work together and be around the table to figure out what those solutions are. Two. 
Um, we do want to make it as a, a very strategic and thoughtful plan, right? We want to do the right studies with the right populations to answer the key questions and have a plan for sustainability and scale from day one. How are we going to do this so it's not just a small demonstration project that shows that it can work in one setting, but how can we expand it and translate those findings to other countries, other populations? We really want to kind of understand what those key implementation strategies are for providers, as well as for patients, for health systems, for policymakers. Um, three, we want to make sure it's a choice, right? We know that there's not one um, prevention strategy that's going to work for everybody. So how do we integrate Cab LA as a choice in HIV prevention strategies for others? And then fourth, um, our kind of framework for how we're thinking about implementation science um, in, in this region for the world is we're taking a, what we call a layer plus approach. So it's pretty self-explanatory, but le the layer piece is that we know that we have really quite remarkable prep delivery health systems out there already. And we want to layer Cab LA into those programs first, right? Um, we know that it's not going to be as exactly the same as delivering oral prep or the ring. So what are those strategies? What are the provider strategies? What are the patient strategies to layer Cab LA into those existing programs? But that's where we want to start, right? We already have a good foundation. Let's build upon it. But in the layer plus approach, I think the plus part is almost as important, if not more important, right? Because we're only reaching a certain number of people with HIV prevention now. How can we reach a greater number? So in that plus piece of the strategy, we want to expand our health system delivery options. We want to work closer with SRH programs. We want to think about telehealth modalities and more virtual modalities. We want to work better with communities. Think about other ways or expanding upon what we've already built for oral prep and how can we integrate and expand our health delivery systems. Great, Maggie, thank you for that. Um, we're going to come back to some of those issues, um, and I, I do want to bring Mopley into the conversation. But before we do, one of the big implementation questions, and Rafe, you kind of alluded to it, um, is around HIV testing. And um, WHO guidelines are in development. We're told we'll come out at AIDS 2022 um, in, in a few months' time. Um, without predicting or prejudging those, um, as you reflect on the experience of 083, where you had uh, more data than, than the 084 did um, with respect to testing and, and potential um, resistance, what's the message? What's the takeaway about how to integrate testing to maximize PrEP and minimize any risks? Yeah, thanks, Mitchell. Um, that's sort of the million dollar question of the moment, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I, and, and I, I say that because the U.S. FDA is part of their approval and the current CDC PrEP guidance, um, and we can talk about the CDC PrEP guidance separately, um, uh, recommends RNA testing at every visit, um, including before starting cabotegravir. Um, and so for U.S. use, I think there's not a lot of leeway um, in negotiating that. That's part of the package and the CDC guidance. Um, I, I think in contexts where that's not available and not feasible, um, I think I want to be really clear in saying that should not be an impediment to cabotegravir use. You know, the original study designs of both 083 and 084 um, used a standard testing algorithm and the superiority result um, you know, stood with that algorithm. You know, there were additional retrospective testing that was done on stored laboratory samples that used these more sensitive tests that formed the basis of that ultimate US FDA and CDC recommendation. But the sites were using um, a conventional testing algorithm. So um, I'll be very interested to see what the WHO recommends. I think it would be a disaster if um, a recommendation were to come out that asked for testing that was not feasible or available at sites and would prevent rollout and scale up of this incredibly potent um, prevention strategy. And, and, you know, I think Sinead's results um, are nothing short of staggering um, in their e e excitement and, and I think really presage the extraordinary need for this product, and I think we have to figure out how to scale it up with available testing. I do think it is a clarion call for um, us to all really advocate 
for rapid improvements and advances in safe, cheap, well supply chained, mm -hmm. uh, sensitive, improved viral diagnostics that will help with all of these mm -hmm. uh, long acting PrEP agents that are going to be now coming into development. Sinead, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I would just agree. I, I think we know that in, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, we know that viral load testing is going to be a barrier potentially to implementation and we don't want to have barriers. I think what we have to start thinking about is what are the conversations that need to be had that articulate the trade-offs and ensure that you know things like um, people who were on PrEP have rapid access to treatment, that clinicians are aware of the potential for the emergence of resistance and are able to make switches uh, in treatment regimens if needed, uh, and that communities understand you know, what those trade-offs are. But if the advantages are to uh, Im introduce a highly effective PrEP agent where the risk of infection is in fact very small, then these seem to be re reasonable trade-offs while we work hard, I think, to develop uh, improved diagnostics over time. I think bo both of you really, I think, nailed it, and I think it really is a message to all of us in picking up on the network and one of the four pillars of the whole network strategy about integrated uh, packages and how testing is core to those but shouldn't be a, an, a, 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 a barrier to prevention, and figuring this out is going to be critical for all of us in the global community. But I do want to bring Mopoli in. In the midst of, of, of a pandemic, of course, these two clinical trials read out, but you also started two um, efficacy trials that um, perhaps for some were under the radar. And I wonder if you could give a quick update on, on the studies and their status and also um, the novelty of the endpoint. Uh, this audience is very familiar with the double dummy, double blind um, uh, design of 083 and 084, comparing cabotegravir to uh, daily oral prep, but you're not doing that. So if you could. Give us a quick sense of, of purpose one and purpose two. Great. Uh, thank you, Mitchell. And I also just want to thank everybody for the opportunity to come speak and talk to you about Lenacapavir and our prevention program, uh, which is called the Purpose Program. So um, it's really <coughs> remarkable the collaboration and the um, activities that we were able to conduct all by Zoom. And if you had told me four years ago that we would start studies in five countries globally, South Africa, Uganda, <coughs> Peru, and Brazil, um, you know, over Zoom, I would have thought it was crazy. Uh, in, our, in my past pre-pandemic life, we visited every site before we initiated them, and that's not what happened here. So it was really a testament to using, being able to use the technology and the advances in the way we communicated and, um, and the, the proactive nature of our sites and our investigators, so, a lot of whom are here today. So it's great to see everybody finally in real life. So um, yeah, we were able to implement Purpose One, which is our study in cisgender adolescent girls and young women that's taking place in South Africa and Uganda. That study has 5,010 <coughs> people that will be enrolled. And then we're also um, very excited to have uh, implemented Purpose 2, which is taking place in the US, South Africa, Peru, and Brazil. That study has 3,000 individuals, and uh, those individuals are cisgender gay men, transgender women, and for the first time, transgender men and gender non-binary individuals, who, all of whom have sex with uh, people assigned male at birth. And, um, we were able to implement the studies and start them during the um, pandemic, and we've recently restarted uh, or reinitiated uh, screening and enrollment in our studies um, uh, since our clinical hold. I'll just comment <laughs> briefly on the clinical hold. So our clinical hold uh, occurred because not having anything to do with our drug, lenacapavir, which is a subcutaneous injection that's given every six months, but it had to do with the bottles that the lenacapavir were stored in. And I learned so much about different kinds of glass in this process. <laughs> so I didn't know, I thought glass was glass, but we, we started out using borosilicate vials because of a supply chain issue, another feature of the pandemic. 
Um, and uh, there were some concerns that lenacapivir could interact with the borosilicate vials. So the FDA wanted us to explore that, and they asked us to hold on the studies last December. And we worked very closely with them to sort out and make sure we answered all their questions and did all the investigations that they wanted. And we also were able to receive the study, uh, supply of a new kind of glass that doesn't have this issue called aluminosilicate <coughs> glass vials. So a couple, month, a couple weeks ago, the FDA lifted the clinical hold, and we are now resuming screening and enrollment um, of the lenacapavir that's going to be stored in the new kind of glass vial. So uh, we're up and running again, and it's very exciting once we get the vial shipped all around the world and um, make sure all the regulatory and ethics approvals for the revised protocols and stuff are in place, um, we'll be going full steam ahead. Uh, and so, Mitchell, you asked me to talk about um, the counterfactual design of the study. So the last thing I will share with you is uh, we um, worked very closely with the Forum on Collaborative Research and many of the people in this room uh, and online uh, to develop a new way to study PrEP drugs. Uh, the oral PrEP drugs, FTAF and FTDF, are highly effective if taken as directed. And when drugs are so effective, if you do a double dummy, um, double blinded, non inferiority trial, you need really large numbers of people to evaluate whether uh, a dr drug is efficacious or not. And so for that reason, uh, the traditional trial design was challenging and not uh, able to be used in the next generation of PrEP trials. So both the Islatravir trials and the lenacapavir trials are using this novel design. And this is a design where we compare the incidence on the new drug to the background HIV incidence in the screened population. And so it's kind of like having a hypothetical experimental placebo arm. So you will be comparing uh, the number of infections on your study arm with this hypothetical placebo arm, and you'll get an efficacy estimate as well as safety comparisons uh, for, for your new drug compared to the background incidence. And how do we calculate that background incidence? We have, before the randomized section of this study, something called the screening incidence cohort where we take all the people who we're evaluating if they're going to um, be eligible for this study, and we test them with a regular HIV test. And if they're positive, we test them with something called a recency assay, which is a special test that allows us to be able to understand at a population level if a group of people were infected in the last six months to a year, depending on how you use the algorithm. So by using this recency assay, which is a detuned assay, and the way it works is um, as one is infected with HIV, your, an your antibodies develop better avidity or stickiness to HIV, and it, this, these tests take advantage of that antibody evolution to be able to tell whether you were recently infected or you have long-standing infection. And so we take the people who are recency positive and we use a testing algorithm um, and some math to back calculate what the incidence is in the screen population. Great. Yeah, Mopley, thank, thank you. And if anyone ever thought the HIV prevention field was static, <laughs> you just have to learn about detuned assays, um, background incidents through um, uh, the, the assay, and, um, and about glass vials. Um, it's a dynamic space. And I want to pick up on that, Mopley, um, about the dynamic space. When you began the two, well, particularly Purpose One with, with cisgender women in Africa, um, of course, we had oral prep as an approved product. Um, now um, the vaginal ring has been approved in a number of countries, including where, where this trial is happening. Um, we think, we hope, cabotegravir will soon be approved. How will the trial um, think about or adjust with these newer interventions um, as you begin screening and enrollment now? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, um, you know, we, like everyone in this room, is are super excited to have multiple options and new options for HIV prevention, per, particularly in six gender adolescent girls and young women in South Africa and Uganda. So. The trial design I refer to is a randomized control trial that is actually evaluating two primary endpoints in Purpose One. It's looking at the efficacy of our long-acting drug, lanacapavir, and it's also looking at the efficacy of Descovy in women. So the randomized control 
trial part that we've powered for looks at those two primary endpoints, compares them to background incidents, and also has an active internal control of the Truvada arm. So after um, we determine whether lenacapavir and Discovy work in the primary efficacy analysis, everyone has an opportunity to switch to the open label extension with lenacapavir if it's shown to be safe and effective. And then if anyone discontinues the long-acting drug during the study, they go on to the PK tail phase with oral Truvada. And our plan will be that we will definitely modify the protocol once the dipivirine ring and um, or cabotegravir are potentially available in the countries that we're studying it and we have the results with pregnancy for cabotegravir, we can modify that uh, PK tail and offer people other options in the PK tail if they wanted to use the dipivirine ring or potentially cabotegravir. Our trial is unique in many ways in the inclusivity on the purpose one side. We're uh, supporting people in their reproductive choices so folks can, if they want to get pregnant, get pregnant during the study. We're not requiring uh, long-acting hormonal contraception or double methods of hormonal contraception. So cabotegravir would not be an appropriate choice for this group since we're supporting people in their pregnancy, in their interest in pregnancy. So once we have that data, which you guys are working on, which is really exciting, that could become an option in the trial, in the, in the PK tail of the trial. Great, thank you, and, and I think um, great applause for, for that um, design uh, adjustment and building on the experience of other trials. Um, you know, Maggie, as, as uh, we talk about moving from efficacy to hopefully not only to introduction, but eventually to impact, um, I know for many of us, uh, particularly people uh, outside of the United States, um, COVID vaccines show us um, the elegance of the science um, not being met by very elegant uh, and equitable <coughs> delivery. And I'm wondering, um, as, as, a, as a company, as the developer of the product, um, how are you all thinking about making sure that we um, do better with equity and affordability with, with cabotegravir for PrEP than, um, than we've done as a global health community with respect to, to global equity for COVID vaccines and so many other things in, in public health. Yeah, no, thanks Mitchell for the question. And I do apologize for my coughing up here on stage. I did take my COVID test this morning, it was negative. <laughs> so, um, um, but uh, Vive's strategy for Cab LA for PrEP in LMICs is to maximize rapid access and uptake. Um, of Cab LA for PrEP in populations of highest unmet need. Now, once again, I talked about the power of partnership to deliver on our HIV prevention strategy, and that really can't be overemphasized. Our common purpose here is to accelerate the HIV prevention response, but uh, responsibility and accountability needs to be robust and shared amongst donors, policymakers, health systems, multilateral, bilateral agencies, um, regulators, civil society, private sector, and the such. And we understand that pricing and affordability is, will have a big impact on access, and we're working to ensure that we play our part in making Cab LA for PrEP accessible in LMICs through our pricing policies, our manufacturing strategies, and partnerships and collaborations. So at Vive Healthcare, we do not expect to profit from sales of our licensed products to public programs or international donor agency programs in all low-income or least developed sub-Saharan African countries. We recently announced uh, our commitment to grant voluntary license for patents relating to cabotegravir long-acting for PrEP to the medicine patent pool. We're very excited about that. This builds upon our long-standing partnership uh, between Vive and the MPP, which has been highly successful in um, facilitating the manufacture and sale of low-cost versions of Vive healthcare medicines in countries most affected by HIV. So we're looking forward to be able to uh, provide this at low cost to uh, the people that could benefit most. And our access team, I'm not on the access team, but our access team at Vive would be happy to follow up with any further information.
Great, Maggie, thank you. And I am getting the, the hook. Um, we did start a little bit late. I will say, for people who want to keep the choice conversation and the choice agenda alive, um, we've just started at AVAC a new uh, choice agenda platform, uh, listserv and webinar series. Jim Pickett, who's here in the room, um, who's not as tall and blonde as Ian Sana, but um, is, is fabulous in his own right, um, is here, and we'd love to have you engage. But as we end, I'm going to ask, just we'll start with you, Mopley, at that end, um, 15 seconds each. Um, we're 10 years next month to the approval of daily oral prep in this country, and I think we all would say we have failed to deliver on its promise. And maybe perhaps fitting to start with the person from Gilead, but I wonder if each of the four of you could quickly say, what can we do differently this time with cabotegravir, with lenacapavir if it proves to be safe and effective, with any next generation product to go faster? Yeah, we, we must do better. Um, and I think the, the primary ways that we're working on doing things better and differently this time around is learning from the lessons of the last 10 years and um, ensuring that we do implementation science and integrated evaluations is part of our pivotal trials. So we um, just had a publication over the weekend that I'd like to shout out. Michelle Cespedes um, has an excellent paper in PLOS One about our strategies to incorporate uh, as much as we can in the actual pivotal programs to understand people's interests and preferences and how they would use the drugs if found to be effective. So I think that that's critical. We're also pursuing similar elements, so we have data on exposure in pregnancy and lactating persons and in infants at the time of approval should the drug be approved. And I think by um, incorporating all of that type of work with quantitative and qualitative behavioral research, as well as the special programs that we're working on uh, with HPTN and US women and people who inject drugs, we're going to have a huge amount of information to support not just efficacy and safety data, but how to use it and how well to use it and how it would work the best. And that's the kind of information that health uh, authorities and um, folks who make access decisions rely on to make those drugs available to the people who need it the most. Great. So in the spirit of getting even faster um, over the decade, Maggie. Okay. Even faster. Well, we need to start now, right? Cabotegravir long-acting is the first long-acting prevention strategy out of the market. It's not going to be the last. We're going to have easier uh, deliveries, uh, longer acting. Hopefully this is a bridge to a cure. But why wait Till the future. Let's start now. Let's build those health delivery system platforms now to be able to deliver long acting to the greatest number of people we can, and we'll build upon that. We'll continue to build um, day by day, uh, year by year, moving Group. forward. Fabulous. Sinead and Rafi, you can do Mike Cohn speed. <laughs> Well, I think um, there's already been a lot learned about the barriers. I think we know a lot more about what data countries need. Uh, I think there's been work to develop a product introduction framework, which is agnostic to products, which has certainly been helpful for thinking about cab introduction. The trials have been able to try and address some of these questions faster around adolescent populations, pregnant and breastfeeding populations. Um, so trying to anticipate cost, uh, there have been those analyses. And then I think sort of um, as much as possible being able to support the rapid transition into implementation with data that also advises implementation. And I'll just be extremely quick and say um, we've learned a lot that critical to successful implementation scale up um, is demand creation. And so I think we need to be doing that right now. Thank you. Just building it doesn't mean they'll come. Fabulous. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch, and um, thank you for our panelists. It's a terrific session, and I think there'll be plenty of opportunities at this meeting over the next several days uh, to learn more and to answer some of the questions. I know we got some questions virtually, but we didn't have time uh, to address them. But please uh, find the speakers uh, as, and uh, try to communicate with them. So we're going to move on now to the second uh, panel uh, roundtable uh, today. And I'll please invite the uh, everybody to come up, all this. Uh so we need uh, Sari and um, Steve Shapta will be joining us uh, virtually, and Laurent Nelson and Linda Stranix. 
Okay, and while um, everybody's coming up uh, to the podium, I'll just very briefly introduce our speakers. As you know, this session is focusing on um, a second pillar of um, one of the other pillars of the HPTN agenda, and that's on uh, integrated uh, strategy for prevention of HIV. And uh, we have with us today Dr. Sari Reisner, who's the Director of Transgender Research at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Fenway Institute of, um, of Health in Boston. And he's also uh, a, a professor of uh, medicine at Harvard uh, Medical School. And then Steve Shapta, who unfortunately cannot be with us, but I'm very hopeful that he is online. Um, there he is. Welcome, Steve. It's great to see you. And, uh, and uh, Steve is, he is the protocol co-chair for HPN 094, and he's a professor at the University of California in, at UCLA in the Departments of Family Medicine and Psychiatry. And then also, hi, welcome um, uh, Dr. Laurent Nelson. Hi, Laurent, good to see you in person. Uh, and uh, Laron is the co-chair of HPTN 096. He's an associate dean for global affairs and planetary health and the Independence Foundation and associate professor at the Yale School of Nursing. Welcome, Laron. Great to have you here with us. And then we also have Linda um, Stranix Chubanda, who is a pediatrician, advocate for children's health, has been very involved in clinical trials related to prevention and treatment of HIV in children and adolescents. And uh, she's been, of course, critically engaged in the HPTN adolescent studies, particularly HPTN uh, 08401. So welcome, everyone, today. And I have a few slides that I'm going to show. Um, if they happen, they happen. If not, we can keep going. OK, great. Um, let's move on to um, the next slide. And uh, very briefly, as you heard from uh, Mike's uh, excellent presentation this morning, is one of the pillars of the HPTN is the discovery pillar. And we just heard about uh, the focus on, for example, long-acting antiretrovirals for prevention from the panel before. And the second pillar is the population impact, and that gets at the integrated strategy agenda for the HPTN. And you saw this uh, slide before as well. Uh, but I'm going to focus going through the slides that we're doing now and what are the interventions that we are layering um, around biomedical interventions uh, to be able to go beyond efficacy to effectiveness and population impact, as we heard before. Uh, it's wonderful to have new discoveries, new methods, new delivery uh, systems, but it's equally important to understand and appreciate and achieve high uptake, high coverage, high uh, persistence and adherence and so on. Um, I'm going to skip this. And very quickly, you know about 091, and that's uh, co-chaired by uh, Sari, who's with us today, and Tonya Petit. And uh, that is a study that is focused on uh, transgender women. And the women are uh, randomized to immediate or delayed arms of the study with a focus on increasing the uptake of um, and adherence with uh, PrEP overall. And, um, and the, the team has designed a beautiful study where they're laying around that uh, biomedical intervention uh, efforts at um, uh, providing uh, gender-affirming interventions and other uh, peer support and psychosocial support. Next slide will show us uh, 094, which is uh, similarly uh, also an integrated strategy study. And that is uh, for persons who inject drugs in the United States. And that study is um, recruits um, uh, people who inject drugs uh, through mobile units, and then once they're eligible, have consented, they're randomized to an intervention arm or an active control arm, and we'll hear more about this. And the intervention arm, where all of the interventions are delivered on the mobile van, and these include not just focusing on HIV per se, HIV uh, prevention, prep, or treatment, but also on primary care and medications uh, to prevent overdose, uh, as well as also um, interventions for hepatitis C and, and many other um, uh, health issues that um, this population suffers from. And then the third um, uh, integrated strategy study that you heard about is 096, which is focused on um, uh, men who have sex with black men who have sex with men in the US South. And this study also wraps around 
the biomedical intervention like testing and prep and treatment layers uh, four interventions that you can see here on the slide uh, an intervention that's focusing on intersectional um, uh, stigma reduction prevention as well as uh, peer support a social media intervention and also health equity intervention all of these are really um, uh, attempting to uh, achieve an increased uptake of testing as well as uptake of uh, PrEP and, and treatment for this uh, population and ultimately to make an uh, impact on the, um, uh, on the health and well-being of, this, in the, of, these, of these men. And just overall, I think the characteristics of integrated strategy studies are, are as follows. They focus on a specific population, as you saw from the examples, the three uh, examples that this HPTN is doing now. They have broad eligibility criteria. Uh, they combine, of course, they, uh, they, uh, they're centered on efficacious biomedical intervention, which are PrEP and treatment, and testing, or could be um, uh, some of the new interventions like uh, BNABs or MPTs. And they're packaged with tailored behavioral and structural interventions, and the goal is to enhance either reaching the population, enhance their knowledge, enhance their adherence or uh, persistence on the interventions. And they're aimed at demonstrating, as I said, optimal effectiveness in a specific population. And most, imp and very importantly, is that hopefully they provide uh, concrete insights into how do we get to population impact uh, overall and, and advance uh, public health uh, for the populations of interest. So with this brief introdu in introduction, we're going to move on now to, I guess I move here. I guess I could stay here. Um, Maybe it's better if I don't have a mask that I'm staying here. Um, and we'll, st we'll start with some uh, questions for, uh, for our panelists. And I want to start, uh, maybe I'll start, let me start with you, Linda. And um, you can share with us uh, some of the, um, your area of interest has been simply on adolescence. And uh, thinking about the studies that have been done and, um, and the need to get new biomedical interventions. What else do we need, to, in your experience, do we need to wrap around those interventions to be able to achieve uh, effectiveness down the line? Thank you, Rafa. And um, I think many of the, the issues that we deal with with adolescents are very similar to the issues that have been dealt on the, on the adult studies. But obviously, adolescents have an additional layer that they require for engagement and some additional, um, some specific considerations because they are not always acting as their own person. They don't have full autonomy. They have an awful lot of stigma that they have to counter, which is directed at them specifically because of their age. So there might be stigma because adolescent sex is taboo in many cultures and in many settings. So I think the, um, in terms of access and in terms of protection, the issues that we need to, to look at for adolescents are the same as we do with, with adults, but with an additional need for engagement. So, so maybe I can touch on those for the consenting issues, because we, we've we just finished, um, well, not quite finished, but we're rolling over into the OLE stages for 08301 and 08401. And um, we took some time to reflect with the staff on their experiences specifically for consenting, because the structural and social behavioral barriers that are faced with PrEP access are also the similar barriers to consent. And consent is based on respect. And having an adolescent fully understand and comprehend all the different pieces of information that they must know to come onto the study, there's a lot of overlap. So um, the, the top tips that we got back from the sites were very interestingly similar across the different continents because we we'd implemented the study in the US as well as in Africa. And all the teams unanimously said that it begins with community engagement. And the, the number of different topics that the adolescents had to comprehend and understand before coming on to trial 
really helped if we engaged communities with a lot of information exchange, knowledge exchange. It's not information giving, it's an exchange of knowledge, starting with the community knowledge of the various aspects of research literacy, HIV, adolescent sex, as well as PrEP. And once all of that was done, then we could begin to move into the trial. And then maybe the structural things, or what I call structural, at protocol team level, at site team level, we had to have the right staff with the right training doing the engagement processes. There had to be people who could listen to understand what the adolescent was saying, where they were coming from, and then the adolescent would trust, they would gain their respect, and they would begin to open up and have all these questions and myths about what they were hearing in the community. Those had to be overcome before we could begin talking about the study. And in essence, that might be something that we will see as we're going into the implementation phase for the programs, is there's all these myths and misconceptions at community level that need to be addressed. And it's the same with consent. So that was the main issue, was engaging the communities and overcoming the the myths and misconceptions to be able to have these conversations and exchange the knowledge about the product and about the research as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, you mentioned engagement with the community. And moving on to you, sorry, is um, um, as you know, the HPTN 091 is actually the very first network of uh, not just HPTN network, but the, all of the NIH network study uh, that's focused on transgender women. Um, so um, can you share with us some of the maybe uh, successes, challenges in engaging this population, which yeah. was a new population for our sites to engage? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so well, first of all, I want to uh, you know, thank the network. And, uh, and it, is, it is time that there's a trans women specific study. And um, it's wonderful that we're doing it. And I want to thank everybody for that. And also all the sites and the staff that making it happen. So that's really number one. So I just, I'm here. It's definitely not me. Okay. <laughs> that's the first thing. Um, in terms of community engagement, you know, the, the, the biggest thing is, I think, trust and the biggest lesson that we're learning. And we know this in many populations that have been traditionally marginalized, excluded, face high levels of stigma. Uh, the same things that essentially, you know, drive, uh, if you will, the epidemic. At itself uh, actually are driving participation in research or not participating in research, potentially. Um, and so that makes uh, community engagement around trust especially important. And um, so before we can actually mobilize and get a study up and running, we need to build that trust. But even before that, we need to consult the community uh, in the design and execution of the study. And so one of the things about 091 is we did a series of community consultations. Um, Dr. Tony Petit is a co-chair. Um, and we went around to cities and talked a lot about and got uh, a lot of insights from community. And the design was really directly shaped by those insights. So uh, the idea of having the de deferred arm and the immediate arm, the, uh, the time, the six month time period of active intervention, um, the, uh, the, and uh, allowing, a, in a sense, in, encouraging all trans feminine, transgender women who are on the trans feminine spectrum to participate. So having that be a definition of the population, um, having that be open in that way, very important. Um, and as we're doing these things in the field, all of that has made a difference. So that design and that intentionality and the design has really made a difference. Now, some of the thing is about building trust is it takes time. It takes energy that takes time and it takes uh, showing up again and again and again. And I think that's really been such a critical lesson learned. It's also that multiple touch points are needed. You know, it's not enough to just have be in one space, but to be in multiple spaces. Um, the trans women community, trans feminine communities are not monolithic. They're very diverse. Uh, there's a lot of different um, sub-communities. And uh, it's important, for example, to uh, you know, recruit uh, Latina trans women uh, who are Spanish speaking, which we're doing Spanish speaking you know, as part of this as well in English and Spanish, um, and, and to uh, reach black women uh, who are disproportionately uh, burdened by the epidemic. 
so these kinds of things to really work with subpopulations in some communities and to recognize the heterogeneity is incredibly important. So mm -hmm. time takes time and trust is uh, absolutely essential. So I'll stop there for now. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I, I distinctly remember the, um, the preparatory engagement with the community that really changed the design of the study fundamentally. And I think it's an interesting uh, experience and I think it's, um, it's something we should think about uh, when we're designing other studies. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thanks to you, Antonia. I'll move on to Laurent. And um, so 096 is distinguished by being a complex study. Uh, people use the term. I always say, if you have a complex problem, you need a complex study to overcome the problem. <laughs> but, um, and it's also a community randomized study. Most of our studies are individual randomization. Um, with the exception of several studies that the HPTN has done. So can you talk a bit about the, com you know, the complexities of engagement and doing a community intervention randomization study versus a, the traditional individual randomization? Uh, thank you. Part of the, the challenge or the complexity of doing it, a multi-level study, an integrated study, is that you have to have the components actually <laughs> integrate and the timing is key. So we, we have studies that are operating at a structural, well, 096 is operating at a structural level, at a behavioral level, and even at the level of uh, healthcare facilities. So those things have to be sequenced right. They aren't sort of many, many MINI, small 25% level interventions. These are full scale interventions that have to work in a very particular sequence and have to sort of be operating at a very particular time. And so, that is a major challenge is if it's an individual level, you can manage that uh, a bit more. When it's large community level, you need whole communities to move at a particular time. You need whole facilities to be trained in intersecular stigma reduction at a particular time so that patients are ready to go and receive PrEP or treatment at that clinic. The timing can be very challenging, but that is, that is uh, I think that's a big complexity of trying to do a study like this with multiple levels. They really require everything to be acting in a particular sequence. Great, thank you. And I think obviously you've also done a lot of community engagement activities um, to prepare. Uh, Th that the really is study. foundational for it. So, mm -hmm. like, you have to get the community's involvement from the beginning because that has to already be an activation. So, none of this stuff works without the community being engaged and interested in this. And so that's been what we started, even before we started the study, mm -hmm. was really trying to get out into the community, understanding what preferences, what they wanted, where they wanted and how it needed to be. So that is foundation to what we tried to do. Yeah, and I, and just to add, I think not only was it the community of interest, the population of interest, but you needed to engage other communities as well, yes. uh, which is kind of interesting. Maybe we'll have time to talk about that. I'm just gonna go to Steve, who's with us uh, sure. virtually, and uh, Steve. Um, so you, the HPTN 094 is really all about going to where the people are at, um, which is a kind of a fundamental public health principle, not to wait for people to come to you, but go to them with the services. So can you tell us about how kind of you arrived at these interventions and the use of the mobile van and so on? Sure, thanks, Wamba. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I have that, uh, I'm getting over that crazy virus that's taken a lot of us out. But, but anyway, um, so how we developed this was a set of consultations, much as the process is very similar to what LeBron and Sari were talking about. Um, we have this fundamental idea that um, there's not enough medication to be able to medicate our way out of this any situation. So. The idea of bringing medication to people is just the beginning. So the idea of this structural rethink of how we get interventions to people is at the foundation here. It's not, so the mood and the man is actually an important piece of the work, um, but in many ways, it's symbolic of all of the work as well. We bring, people, we bring care to communities. Um, we also know that among people across the population, the beautiful work that was represented in the last um, in the last um, setting was was really something that was um, just a, a breathtaking in terms of the medication development. And for many people, we know that they're able to um, take their medications and be able to uh, do well without much intervention. 
But we know that people who use drugs, people who inject drugs, other folks who have psychiatric conditions, people who are living close to the streets, housing instability, that those, that simple, that simple thing of taking your medication in the morning, that simple first step toward health is often very difficult to do. So we really wanted to make sure that we took as many barriers away as possible um, and you know, built this integrated, um, integrated strategies approach that is at the intersection of addiction medicine and infectious diseases. It's neither addiction medicine nor infectious diseases. It is at that intersection. And that is what, that's the concept we use to roll these units out into community. Yeah, it certainly sounds um, essentially what you're doing with breaking some silos that uh, exist um, in our health system overall, uh, you know, between addiction medicine, infectious disease, HIV, and primary care, and so on. Um, I think, Linda, you wanted to add something. Uh, yes, I just wanted to, to back up again about the timing of the community engagement. Mm -hmm. And so much needs to be done before the study begins. So much needs to be done to prepare and mobilize communities before you begin that outreach and recruitment. But please, again, with adolescents, they're evolving constantly, they're growing, they're maturing in these huge steps and bounds. And we found with engaging our adolescent groups, we were having to go back again and again as they were maturing and coming up with new ideas and new concepts. And their parents also kept having new questions as well. So the support that the parents needed, who are another group we should engage, was very curious and very interesting because the parents often had just as many questions as the adolescents did, not just about the study, but how to support their child throughout the study. So this again came back to our retention, it came back to our consent, making sure that people had the information and that was changing because the circumstances were changing constantly. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. And um, you know, in think thinking about this idea of um, of the community overall, how they can support participants in studies is interesting as well. And you're thinking of the parents, but in other contexts, it may be a different kind of uh, supportive uh, community around them. Uh, maybe going to you, Sari, and uh, you know. Um, I know that uh, I've been on several of the calls of the team and a, a lot of sharing of lessons learned, a lot of kind of the teams from each very different communities, whether it be in Brazil or in New York or San Francisco or Philadelphia, you know, it's Houston, very different communities. And how have you, what have you learned by bringing together the teams from across the different sites? Yeah, thank you. I think that's one of the most, um, bringing together of everybody in different sites is one of the best uh, parts of this. Uh, I think it's where a lot of the creativity comes in. Um, we uh, have had uh, different groups, study teams present uh, kind of things that they've been doing in terms of recruitment and engagement, lessons learned. Um, it's been great. Some sites hadn't been doing some things and were like, hey, that's a great idea, you know. So, for example, incentivized recruitment peer to peer. Um, and, uh, and so that process, it, it's just, it's critical uh, to share those lessons learned. And you know, some local contexts, um, communities are different, right? Geographically, how, how communities coalesce. And you know, we've certainly found that uh, in doing this study. So you know, some recruitment strategies have worked better, better in some geographic locations than others. Um, so you know, that's a very important uh, learning space too, is to, to kind of be able to map the local communities and really have a, um, a sense of what local communities uh, are, are really doing. And um, you know, in terms of those lessons learned and sharing, you know, this study really, it does wrap around services. So the idea really is to wrap around you know, prevention, you know, it, particularly PrEP, we're all PrEP, uh, in, in terms of uh, uptake and adherence for outcomes. And, and it's gender af affirmation is the real piece, right? Because gender affirmation is uh, a really vital determinant of health. So, you know, when we're talking about population specific strategies, uh, we hear that all the time, there's an unmet need for gender affirmation. And so the, uh, the uptake and, and people would like to access gender affirming hormones as part of this intervention. Um, also uh, peer support, uh, there's a peer health navigation succession curriculum to get people linked to other, both to affirm their gender with peers, but also to get them linked to other necessary services such as mental health services, housing, and those other, uh, those other uh, entities that we know are so vital for people's lives. 
Um, but the lessons learned in sharing is also around, you know, mapping local resources. How do the teams map the local resources that are available in that, in that context? And it's also very important to see what is and isn't available uh, in those areas and to have the team share that. Well, you know, in Houston, we have this available, but in Philly, we don't, right, or, or vice versa. So uh, it also helps us to see unmet needs in other domains uh, in those local contexts uh, that need to be filled. So that's an important piece, too. Thank you. And um, going to you, Laron, I think one of the challenges we always have in this arena of integrated strategy research is um, we think of it as a strategy, like a package. Uh, but there's always the question that people ask is, how do you know in the end which one did what? Which of these interventions um, had the, more, the most impact and so on? How would you respond to uh, that challenging question that we, uh, I know we hear all the time uh, in, when we're doing this kind of research? It is indeed a challenging question uh, to think about how to respond to. I would say it's, okay, so imagine you're at some holiday dinner and uh, you have dinner and now it's time for dessert and so you go into the, they clear the table, then somebody brings out eggs and butter and a bag of potatoes and some sugar and then they wait for you to eat. And, <laughs> but nobody's eating because those are ingredients. That's what you use to make a pie, but it's not a pie, right? And you wouldn't expect someone to say, what, what is the, the thing that makes this pie? Do the eggs by themselves make a pie? Of course not, why would they? Do the potatoes by themselves make a pie? No, why would they? I think what we have now in the state of prevention science, we call them tools, but they are also ingredients. <laughs> They're ingredients for impact but we've not put them together in a way that makes the impact. They're sort of tools that are sort of laid out. We have PrEP, we have, uh, we just heard about Cab LA, treatment as prevention, stigma reduction interventions, health equity interventions, social media influencers, but they're just ingredients laid out on the table. What these integrated strategies do is provide a recipe that we can test to see can we make these come together in the right way to, to make impact, right? If you think about impact as sort of a sweet, delicious pie that's going to get us to where we need to go, that's what we need to do. So I think, I think we have to let go or, or at least be willing to accept that this, we won't be able to see attribution from one <laughs> ingredient that's going to make the difference. It will not. Uh, but we can look at how these things contribute to the impact that we want to have. We can make it. Uh, but we need the right recipe, and that's what 096 is trying to do, is test this specific recipe to see can we make these core ingredients, TASC, mm -hmm. CAB-LA, oral prep, uh, rapid testing, home-based testing, can we make it have the impact, but it has to all be done together. That's beautiful, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I think it applies to 091 and 094 and all our integrated strategies. It is about the pie, <laughs> not about the ingredients. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Steve, um, one of the unique uh, features of uh, 094 is the fact that you have what's called an active control. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, that arm of the study? Sure. Thanks, Wafa. So the, the, the active control condition is actually uh, an ethical obligation to the 094 team. Thanks to the team, we've really been across the cities in the U.S., recognizing that the services for people who inject drugs are largely non-existent. So when you drive the bus in to provide those services and you want to randomize people to a condition that involves a standard of care, um, what, we, what we learned was that there is no standard of care for people who inject drugs and largely for people who use drugs writ large. I mean, this, there's just nothing out there. Um, this whole desert of services for people who have additional social, economic, uh, cultural, legal reasons for why they're prevented from accessing resources within society uh, really concentrate on people who inject drugs. And so what we needed to do was to say, to ethically conduct the study, we want to have a, a condition that is actually somewhere near what we, we would expect for standard of care. 
And that would be the ability for someone to, as the discussion has been going on, to coordinate the wraparound of services, that there are bricks and mortar services within most communities that people who inject drugs need. But what we can't do is figure out how to get the person who needs those services to those points of contact. And that would be the peer navigator condition that we um, actually implemented that as the active control. We pulled on prior HPTN studies. Uh, Dr. Nabila Elbasel actually did a great job in coordinating and writing the manual for the peer navigation service uh, that's implemented as the foundation of the study. Um, and we can really say that there is going to be help coming to all participants in the study um, and that we're going to we're going to measure not what treatment is like in standard of care, but what treatment should be like in standard of care compared to this integrated strategy where we bring treatment to people. Great. Thank you, Steve. And that's a pretty unique feature of the study, but necessitated by the, the, situa the dire situation uh, that this population faces day in, day out. Um, in the last few minutes, I think, of this session, I just want to go and ask everybody the same question, and you can um, respond as you see fit. But uh, in trying to do this, what's the one thing in trying to do either a specific study or your work, Linda, what's the one thing that has surprised you the most in terms of trying to do this work? And, uh, and we'll start with you first. And what surprised you? What's something you didn't expect? Yeah. OK. Um, well, it was a nasty surprise, and um, to me, it was the multiple traumatic events that our study participants experienced in the short time they were with us. And um, it wasn't a pleasant surprise at all, but it was one that definitely kept the study teams engaged and active to give our participants the support they needed to remain on trial if that was still in their best interests and to work with them and their parents through the, um, the, the multiple trauma that, that happened. Mm -hmm. And I think that would affect somebody's ability to remain on a PrEP agent regardless of what modali modality they do choose, even the long actings. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested to hear if, if that was something that befell the communities in the adult trials as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And certainly something we need to keep in mind in the Absolutely. future. Absolutely, it will be to me potentially this, uh, part of the intervention. Intervention, yeah, which exactly. Which is another integration. Another dimension. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, what has surprised you thus far with uh, 091? There's so many surprises. <laughs> okay. I wish you could see my smile. These masks <laughs> make it difficult. I'm smiling, actually. Um, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, for, for me, I think that the incredible way that the team has come together and really, uh, you know, work together on this study has been not a surprise, but just a, a, a breath of fresh air. And, uh, you know, there have been challenges along the way, you know, certainly, uh, you know, recruit the pace of recruitment, although we, we recruited 174 women of our 310 and it's going very well, uh, really exciting. Um, the thing that's, that's that we've had to come together about are many. So, so one is that's surprising to me has been the pure health navigation piece around um, hiring the difficulty often of structural barriers to hiring the pure health navigators, uh, sometimes at the institutions themselves. Um, and so this includes if, if people, for example, have a background uh, uh, that comes up uh, in a quarry check or something of this nature, uh, or do not meet the sort of traditional education requirements that are, that are required for some institutions. You know, there's been several cases where we had to like write a letter to the institution saying like, this is the person that's qualified for this position. And they not, may not be qualified in the sort of traditional sense of the word, right? Um, and so it's really been a, a sort of, uh, it, it's, it's been a very important um, piece around the advocacy that it just occurs at all levels, right, in, in working with this population, uh, with many populations, um, but especially with the trans population. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. How about Laron? What were the surprises that um, you didn't anticipate? Yeah, well, for, for 096, I think it really was as sort of big and bold as we thought the study was. I think there was some anticipation that there might be, that it might be too much for communities to take on, that healthcare facilities would say there's no way we can get half or 100% of our people involved in this activity. And that's not been the case. I think, 
I've been surprised at how open and welcoming all the communities have been to this. The fact that I think they feel this sort of a, I think you said sort of breath of fresh air, like finally, <laughs> we're talking about the real issues, we're trying to do something about the real issues. I think that uh, going into healthcare facilities, right, and talking to them about racism and homophobia and sexual stigma and the ways that they might actually be deploying it and the fact that they're open to it and that they want to do better. I think we thought we have to have a plan because when we tell these white folks this thing, they're going to lose their mind. Or if we tell these <laughs> black folks about homophobia, they're going to, you know, it's going to be a problem. It has not been a problem. They've been very welcoming and opening to it. And I think that's been encouraging to us that even though it seemed uh, very, very vanguard at the beginning, and this is really what needs to be done, and that communities have been completely, so far, uh, open to it. That's been a surprise, but a pleasant surprise. Wonderful. What about you, Steve, for the 094? What has surprised you? So that's a great question, and if it were a coin, it would have two sides. On the, on the good side, uh, what surprised me is how uh, consistently HIV clinicians in the United States arrange for medication for opioid use disorder among their patients who are living with HIV. That's amazing. I, I did not expect the uh, size of that activity to uh, actually interfere with us being able to recruit an HIV arm of the study fully powered. Um, actually, we got in the field and learned that that's just not the case, that for people who don't live with HIV, that suite of services, that, hand, that warm handoff to medication for opioid use disorder um, is just not there. Um, and that was really one of the first things that stared us in the face. And we actually had to make a protocol change as a result of that. Um, so there's a really good story in that. On the other hand, what we, if for people who are not living with HIV, who are injecting drugs, uh, what we see is almost the creation of a permanent underclass in this country. Um, that is profoundly disturbing and surprising. We have had two HIV seroconversions, six deaths, 74 serious adverse events, um, just uh, 31 overdoses. Um, it, it's just been really kind of crazy in terms of the size of the, uh, of the health threat faced by this community. And that's, that's been really hard. It's been in Philadelphia, it's been in DC, it's been in New York, it's been in Houston, it's been in LA. All of the sites have had serious problems that are physically based in the introduction of the contemporary change of adding xylazine to fentanyl on the streets is making it so that wounds are not healing. We've had limb amputations already. This is this is really um, third world America, and and you know I think that the ability of HPTN to stand tight and to focus in on this issue is really important. But it is dramatic and it is completely surprising. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Steve. And thank you for highlighting this um, yeah, horrific situation uh, for this population. I think, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I want to thank you all. Uh, I have to say you are all pioneers. Uh, this is not easy work to do, and uh, certainly for you as leaders of the study, as well as also for the sites, all of the sites uh, around the world who are participating in these types of studies and, and other integrated strategies, that, uh, studies that we want to pursue. Uh, I know that this is hard work, but very important work. So thank you very much for your commitment. Thank you. I think we're going to move on to, uh, we're doing a marathon session today. Uh, we don't have <laughs> an actual breaks, uh, but if you need to get up and, you know, whatever, uh, move your legs or uh, take a break or whatever, do that and come back. We have a, what is it? Hmm. Yes, I know, yeah. We have a fantastic session that's going to start right now, which is focused on um, a part of our work that uh, we, we treasure. And uh, Mike uh, referred to that this morning, which is our scholars, uh, our scholars program. Um, so I'm going to hand it over shortly to Stan Vermont, who's going to be presenting uh, the work of the scholars. But before he does, I want to remind everyone that we do have a surprise 
an event at the end of this session, this next session. Uh, so please make sure to stay here with us. Um, and then there's several things we want to remind you uh, when it's time for lunch and also for breakfast. You can see here the locations of where the food is provided uh, on the slide. And uh, as I mentioned before, obviously there are uh, recommendations to please distance and to go outdoors if at all possible in the park. There are to-go containers, so you can do so um, at, your, uh, at your pleasure. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Stan. <laughs> The Stan just broke his mask, so we need an emergency mask supply for Stan. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much, and I'll hand it over to Stan. Welcome, Stan. Thank you. I wanted to explain why I wasn't wearing a mask. <laughs> all right, I guess I guess up here I don't need the mask anyway. But thank you, Wafa. Um, Many of you know all about the Scholars Program, but just very briefly, uh, it was started over a decade ago uh, and um, has been uh, a way of our network to help nurture careers of young investigators of color, uh, of minority sexual orientation, uh, folks who, thank you, who may um, not be sitting at the seats of authority and influence yet, but we would like to see them sitting at those seats in the very near future and even at present. Um, and uh, it really was a response to the fact that uh, in the early 80s when the HIV field got going, it tended to be a lot of folks working uh, in infectious diseases, uh, in virology, and the like, and they were not necessarily uh, uh, ethnically, racially, or um, uh, gender preference uh, diverse, uh, and, uh, and we want to do something concrete about it. So our scholars have access to data from <coughs> the network uh, trials that have been completed. They do secondary data analyses uh, of interest to them, and they um, uh, uh, have a mentor often uh, also team members of the study that's been completed, and they do that work over an 18-month period. Um, I want to acknowledge Daryl Wheeler. Uh, Daryl, where are you? It's, it's bright here. I, there, there he is, Daryl Wheeler, who is our fearless co-leader uh, for our, the domestic side of the program with myself. And then we have uh, online, I believe, uh, Kresh Abdul Karim and David Serwada, uh, who are working primarily on the international side of the scholarship program. I also want to acknowledge uh, Sherry Johnson and Gabriela Salinas Jimenez, who manage the program for FHI 360, Kathy Hinson, who makes it possible, and the uh, steady and consistent support of our uh, fearless leaders, uh, Wafa and Mike. So without further ado, our first scholar, Noelle uh, Sainville, uh, will be online. Uh, she couldn't join us uh, due to uh, clinical commitments at the University of at SUNY Buffalo, but she will be presenting, and this is called scientific speed dating. We have seven presentations in the next 49 minutes. So an exploration of geographic access to substance use treatment programs, violence against women, and HIV risk behaviors presented by myself, Noelle Sainville, assistant professor at the University at Buffalo School of Social Work and current HPTN domestic scholar. And so to give some background and rationale of this project, we know that violence against women and HIV are significant public health issues. And research demonstrates that violence against women and HIV, they're interconnected with women who experience violence, violence are at a higher risk of HIV. And certain factors impact violence against women and HIV. And these include neighborhood level characteristics as well as substance use. When it comes to substance use, we know treatment can decrease both violence against women and HIV. 
However, one factor that's underexplored in the literature that must be considered before treatment can be received is geographic access to treatment. And so basically, how does where one lives and their ability to access treatment in their own neighborhood, how does this impact HIV risk and violence against women? And so this project seeks to fill the gap in the literature that pertains to geographic access to substance use treatment, violence against women, and HIV. And it has three aims. The first aim is to assess the relationship between geographic access to substance use treatment programs and neighborhood level characteristic variables. First, on violence against women. We'll do the same thing in looking at HIV risk. And then that third aim is to look at the intersection of HIV and violence against women by analyzing this relationship between geographic access to substance use treatment programs, neighborhood level characteristic variables, and violence against women among participants with HIV risk and participants without HIV risk, respectively. And so this study utilized data from HPTN 064, the Women's HIV Serial Incident Study. And data was collected from May 2009 to July 2010 from US women living in select geographic areas with a high prevalence of HIV and poverty. When we look at violence against women, it was operationalized in four different ways for this study. First, as a continuous variable with a yes response to either physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, indicating you've experienced violence against women. And then individually looking at each type of violence against women with physical, sexual, or emotional dichotomous variables, yes or no. The same thing was done with HIV risk. It was operationalized as a continuous variable consisting of nine items as well as a dichotomous variable with HIV risk being defined as a score of greater than zero, basically saying yes to any of the nine items and without HIV risk defined as a score of zero. There was also show social determinant variables, which is our geographic access variable, which was cons or operationalized by using SAMHSA 2010 National Directory of Drug and Alcohol Treatment Programs, and then neighborhood level characteristic variables were included using the US Census Bureau's American Community Survey 2007 to 2011 five year estimates. And those variables are included on the slide. Covariates were also included on the model, and the covariates are on the slide. And with regards to data analysis, we use multi level models to assess our three specific aims. When it comes to results, we see that violence against women decreases as this geographic access to substance use treatment programs increase. When looking at the specific types of violence against women, emotional, physical, sexual abuse, we find that emotional abuse decreases and physical abuse decreases as geographic access to substance use treatment increases, although that um, decrease for physical abuse was not significant. And for participants with HIV risk, they're um, experiencing their risk of experiencing violence against women decrease as geographic access to substance use treatment programs increases. And there was no significant difference for participants without HIV risk. We looked at neighborhood level variables. These were non-significant predictors of violence against women and HIV risk. So in terms of discussion, we know that this longitudinal model of geographic access to substance use treatment centers, it was associated with violence against women and HIV outcomes. And to our knowledge, this is one of the first studies to be conducted. And we know that in the literature, this type of analysis is limited. And so when we look at our implications, our future considerations, this study highlights the need to further conduct research on geographic access to substance use treatment, violence against women and HIV. It points to the need for the exploration of policies 
to increase the geographic access of substance use treatment centers. Um, future studies should aim to integrate more in-depth and detailed violence against women questions opposed to those dichotomy or those three questions of have you experienced the different types of abuse. And future studies should look at individual substance use as a moderator um, between these variables that were looked at in the study. I'd like to give a special thanks to my mentors, Daniel Haley, Gina Wingood, as well as statisticians, Mickey Zhang and Jim Hughes. And here are my acknowledgements. Thank you. All right, that was terrific. Uh, and uh, we're right on time. Uh, Noelle, as she mentioned, is assistant professor at the University of Buffalo uh, School of Social Work in New York State. Our next speaker is Dr. Manuela Bulo, or Bullo. How do you pronounce it, Bullo? Um, it work, she works as an HIV prevention treatment physician at the Hospital Ramos Mejia in Buenos Aires, Argentina. So without further ado. Hi, hello everybody. For me, it's a great honor to be here today presenting my, my work and it, it is great to be a, an HPTN scholar. So uh, I, will, I will be, it, it's hard to present in seven minutes the hard work of one year and a half, but I will try to do my best and please forgive my rusty English. So uh, I have been working with uh, that data from HPTN 068 uh, the HPTN 068 study uh, enrolled participants in rural South Africa in 2011 and 12. Uh, they were young women enrolled in high school and they were followed up until school graduation. The follow up was yearly with interviews and um, labs. Uh, but what drove my research? So uh, we know that alcohol increases the risk of engaging in high risk sexual behavior. We know that risk sexual behavior increases the risk of HIV, HIV acquisition. And for this population that is at extremely high risk of HIV acquisition with young women in that region that account for 26% of new infections, little is known about their association between alcohol use and HIV. So, Three main questions drove my research. The first and ultimate question is, uh, is there an association between alcohol use and HIV incidence in this population? But I also wanted to uh, know if there are some particular uh, alcohol use patterns that are associated with increased risky sexual behavior. And finally, considering that the uh, participants had partner, sexual partners, I wanted to know if the fact that their sexual partners drink alcohol has something to do with the, their selves having alcohol. So for these three different questions, I uh, ran three different type of analysis. For the first one, uh, I ran a Cox proportional hazards model. For the second, a logistic regression model. And for the third one, a cross-sectional analysis. And I will show you uh, the main results here. So for the first question uh, of the association between alcohol use and HIV incidence, uh, there seems to be uh, an association when running the, the model in the unadjusted uh, model, but uh, when we adjusted the model by age and school attendance, this was no longer significant. Uh, so this has to be further studied. Regarding the drinking patterns, we included a, a lot of uh, different drinking patterns that were uh, referred by the participants, uh, like ever using alcohol, uh, heavily drinking, uh, drinking in um, shabins or, or alcohol serving venues. But um, what we then built a model that could include all of them, so, so we only kept in the model the ones that were independent. So we included alcohol, and go into Shabins. Um, let me tell you that anyway, all the uh, drinking patterns had some type of association with um, 
increasing re risky sexual behavior. But in the, in the model uh, that included all of them, both in the crude and in the adjusted uh, model, we found that uh, there was uh, an increased uh, risky sexual behavior associated to all the patterns. Here in the, in the results, I'm not showing it, but also all the participants that received alcohol from their partners, so they were given alcohol from their partners, all of them engaged in any kind of uh, risky sexual behavior. And finally, uh, regarding the partner's alcohol use, we found there is uh, an increased risk of uh, young women's alcohol use when their partners use alcohol. This was uh, demonstrated both in, both in the crude and in the adjusted uh, models. So, what, what can we conclude? Uh, regarding the first question, uh, we cannot say there is a conclusive answer. I think this has to be further studied, but it probably has to do with the, with the power uh, problem because uh, there was a very low incidence of HIV in this particular cohort. So this should be further studied. Uh, but uh, what we learned is that um, no, it doesn't only matter that the participants drink alcohol, it matters how and with whom they drink it. So uh, we need to, uh, when considering implications and future considerations, we need to be very careful uh, when designing new interventions to tackle this issue, probably considering uh, not only the individual behavior, but also the environment, the participants' empowerment, their the behavior of the partners and the community. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And uh, I want to acknowledge the support of the HPTN network and uh, Marce Marcelo Loso for introducing me to the program, Audrey Petitfort, my mentor, and Mary Stoner and Maria Morsi for the, her statistical support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Adedotun Ogunbajo. Uh, Ade is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Boston's Harvard Chan School of Public Health, and uh, he'll be speaking about intimate partner violence. Thank you, Dr. Vermon. So uh, glad to be here and uh, happy to be here with my fellow scholars. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about intimate partner violence among men who have sex with men. Uh, we know that um, intimate partner violence is highly prevalent among men who have sex with men. And uh, we also know uh, through the literature that folks who are exposed to intimate partner violence are more likely to experience psychosocial health problems sexual risk as well as substance use. And um, the hypothesis is that social support might attenuate the effects of experiencing IPV um, on health, um, psychosocial health problems. Um, but there's a, a lack of literature exploring these issues because um, a lot of the studies are centered around women specifically, as well as them being um, cross-sectional in nature and also being um, within MSM being with wide MSM. And so my project had two main aims. The first was to um, explore how experiences of IPV, so specifically physical, sexual, and um, physical, sexual, and emotional, um, predict substance use among black men who are sex with men specifically, and to explore the role of social support in that relationship. So I utilized the HBTN 061 data, uh, which I included over 1,500 MSM, recruited um, between 2009 and 2010 um, in six cities across the United States. And they had assessments that happened at baseline, six months and 12 months. So I utilized uh, generalized estimating equations to assess the association between experiencing IPV at baseline 
uh, which was described as emotional, physical, and sexual, and substance use. So we uh, operationalized substance use as the substances listed below, as well as alcohol use at baseline six months and 12 months. I also utilized the same model to uh, explore the possible moderate, moderating effect of social support. So that was operationalized as high, medium, or low on the relationship between IPV and substance use. So uh, for the first aim, we found that individuals who experienced IPV, and that was oper operationalized as any IPV, uh, was highly prevalent in the sample. So they had around 51% of the sample uh, reported having a history of IPV in the previous year. And we found that experiencing IPV was, associ was significantly associated with substance use as well as alcohol use um, with uh, the odds ratios being presented there. However, we did see that um, social support was not a significant moderator of that association. So uh, at the different levels of social support, the relationship between IPV and substance use as well as alcohol use remained significant and there was no attenuating um, effect there. And so uh, just uh, in thinking about uh, what we found, um, this study findings highlight um, IPV being a, uh, a problem impacting black MSM uh, with over half of the sample reporting a history of IPV. Uh, we did find that um, experiences of IPV um, was significantly associated with both stimulant use as well as alcohol use, suggesting that um, substance use um, could be a possible coping mechanism for those experiencing IPV. And while social support was not a significant moderator, um, there might be other pathways that might be important that might explain the relationship between IPV um, and substance use. Um, our findings reinforce the need for intervention programs um, to help relieve the burden of IPV among black men who have sex with men. Interventions to, should utilize a holistic approach um, to coming up with uh, sustainable solutions, um, both for those who are perpetrating IPV as well as those who are uh, victims or, or those who are experiencing IPV. And uh, future studies should also explore um, the roles of both those who are experiencing as well as those who are perpetuating um, IPV and the impacts of those on psychosocial health as well as substance use. I will like to thank uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Ken Mayer, um, who I believe is here somewhere. It's hard to know with the masks. Um, <laughs> hey, Ken. <laughs> thank you so much for all your help with this, as well as uh, the folks at Sharp uh, for their statistical support um, and the leadership for the program and the other people listed here. Thank you so much. All right, excellent. Um, Dr. Ndidi Amaka Muta Onugaka is a professor, uh, uh, the Julia Okoto Professor of Black Maternal Health in the Department of Public Health and Community Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston. And she will be speaking to us on uh, factors uh, related to PrEP uptake and utilization in young African women. Morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here with you all. Um, as said in my introduction, it's, you know, it's very bittersweet to be here because this has been such a tremendous opportunity for those of us that are interested in HIV research, and I'm a little sad that my time is ending, as I'm sure my cohort is as well. So I'm going to talk to you about um, examining both facilitators' barriers and the implications of that on social support um, using HPTN 082 qualitative data. So. We looked at what gets young African women to begin, which are the facilitators, and to sustain and continue, which are the barriers or the social support around PrEP and PEP uptake utilization. The study had two main aims, assessing the proportion and characteristics of young HIV uninfected women who accepted versus declined at enrollment of the study, and then looking at the quantitative factors that influences young women's decisions to use and both adhere to PrEP in the first three months. 
So this is really important because as we know, young African women represent a large um, constituent of people who are living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. And really we wanted to focus on what gets people to take PrEP and what keeps them sustained for PrEP. Is it their families, is it their partners? What are the qualitative implications for that? <clears throat> and so really our results show that women who perceive themselves to be at higher risk were motivated to use PrEP and this declined significantly after month three. For AIM-1, um, we focused on a comparative analysis, which looked at the barriers, the facilitators, and social support. And then for we conducted an inductive thematic analysis, which looked at the 67 qualitative interviews from HBT and O82 in South African and young Zimbabwean women using in vivo. And then we did some iterative coding to figure out the themes that emerged. So the first theme was really around the support. How do people perceive support? So this is a quote from a participant. She did not understand what we were taking the pills for, and then I explained to her, this is a conversation she's having with her mother. She did not understand that if you take it well, you can be protected from getting HIV. This is what she did not understand. But she's all right, she's happy now. It's my father and my mother, the people who motivate me to take it. And so this participant is talking about just the impact that her family and really that of her parents is having and how once she had the conversation around the benefits of it and how it protects from HIV, they were on board. And so I think this is an important implication for future prevention work is including the role of families. Um, PrEP non-adherence, this, this was an interesting theme because people when they would travel or go to different parts of the country would say, yeah, I spent like a week not taking it because I wasn't around and then they come back and they're less likely to want to take it because of the side effects, right? They're like, oh, I've been off for a week. And so they expressed that they stopped taking or did not feel the need to restart to take it because of some of the side effects and once they skipped it, they were less incentivized to restart. The third one is around really their risk perception. I think this is a place we can make a lot of impact. And so she, the quote is long, but essentially she's saying that she knows her partner has other partners. He lives in another part of the country. And she's very sensitive to when they're t together that she makes sure to protect herself. So we saw that for participants that had an increased risk of HIV, they were obviously more motivated to take PrEP and to adhere to PrEP. Um, and so that also made them feel more comfortable when they were engaging potentially risky sexual behavior behaviors, like this young woman is pretty clear, like her partner has other partners. And what does that mean for her own HIV vulnerability and her own HIV risk? So we know that um, excuse me, PrEP adherence and non-adherence are not only connected to social support, but also to HIV risk perceptions. And they said that they wanted to protect themselves and stay safe, particularly when they were in situations with multiple partners. The role of social support is very important. And I think um, when we looked at the data, we saw that parents and family members played a significant role and, and also partners. And that really was crucial to their benefit, to the PrEP uptake and acceptance. And while they saw it, I think there's a lot of information in there around how the text messages that participants were getting was really helpful in helping them maintain and have the confidence to continue to take PrEP. So I think if we're gonna continue to do this work, I think building on social support and really looking at the family lens. So my PhD is in the Department of Family Science and I'm really interested in the role of family and how families can really center and be a part of this HIV transmission conversation. But also to make sure that our interventions and our, our research is tailored to really focus on what are the immediate needs and how those needs are transient by population and obviously centering the role that partners and family play. Thank you so much. Here's my information. Follow me on Twitter. And I look forward to your questions. I also want to give a shout out to my mentor and everyone listed here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And indeed, let me reassure you that once you're done with the scholars program, you're an alumna, you're with us forever, and we welcome you back at all times. Um, Dr. Donaldson Conserve is an associate professor in the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George, George Washington University. Uh, it's about two metro stops from here. Um, and uh, he is uh, going to present on uh, assessing the impact of case manager intervention dosage on viral suppression in MSM. Um, Good morning, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you this morning. And I have had a very uh, tremendous experience as part of the scholars program, as my uh, cohort um, mentioned. 
And this morning I will be speaking about the assessment of a case management inter intervention dosage impact on viral suppression among men who have sex with men using uh, data from the HPTN 07H study. Perfect, thank you. As we all know, there has been a lot of progress uh, that have been made in the past 30 years or so to help prevent HIV transmission. However, the number of HIV infections remain high, uh, especially among men who have sex with men in the deep south of the United States. And we also know that when people who are living with HIV initiate AR, um, ART early, remain adherent and reach viral load suppression, they are less likely to transmit HIV to their sexual partners. However, viral load suppression remains also lower than the expected rate among MSM, especially among black men who have sex with men. So with the objective of increasing viral load suppression among MSM, the HPTN 078 study investigated the impact of a case manager intervention on viral suppression among men, uh, men who have sex with men living with HIV who are not virally suppressed. For the overall uh, HPTN 078 study design, men who have sex with men who are not virally suppressed were recruited using respondent-driven sampling as well as direct recruitment to eventually be random randomized to the intervention or a standard of care. For the case manager intervention, a strength-based motivational interviewing approach was used to help motivate individuals to link to care and remain engaged in care. And a wide range of support and activities were also provided to the participant in the intervention, including education, clinical care coordination, medical adherence support, and social assistance. And participants were also required to have at least one monthly contact with the case manager during the time of the study. However, it was left up to the participants to decide how many other encounters they could have with the case managers throughout the study. And for my HPTN Scholars Project, I was particularly interested to assess the impact of the case manager intervention dosage among the individuals who were enrolled in the intervention to assess whether those who had in more frequent encounters with the case managers would be more likely to reach viral suppression. And our hypothesis was that participants who have more needs will ask for and receive more help from the case managers, henceforth receiving a higher case manager intervention dosage and would reach uh, viral suppression. This diagram shows the type of encounters that uh, the participants could initiate uh, and, and the range of uh, encounters. It could vary from weekly to monthly and also quarterly. And then on the other side with the blue, on the blue, it shows the kind of activities and support that the case manager could provide to the participants who initiated uh, different encount, um, activities. And then for the dosage of the intervention, we used two um, measures. First, the encounters, which are just the number of inter interactions that the participants had with the case manager. And then for the other uh, measures, we used the number of activities, so focusing more on the actual support that the intervention participant would receive, uh, such as clinical care coordination, medical adherence support, and social assistance. And the main outcome for the, the analysis for my project was the viral load status at month 12 among the people who were in the intervention group that could either be suppressed or unsuppressed. And then the analysis was limited to only the 62 participants who had a final viral load status at month 12. And we used a descriptive t-test to assess the impact of the case manager intervention dosage on the viral suppression among the individuals who were in the intervention group with complete data. So overall, there were a total number of unique encounters of 1,168. And surprisingly, the people who were suppressed had fewer uh, number of encounters with the case manager intervention compared to those who were unsuppressed. And then for the total number of activities, we had a to there was a total of 3,002 overall number of activities. And similarly, the individuals who were suppressed had fewer number of activities uh, with the case uh, manager. 
And for the overall findings, we found that there was no statistically significant association between the number of encounters and viral load suppression. And then there was a statistically significant finding between the number of activities um, and viral load suppression. However, it was in the opposite direction that we were expecting with individuals who were suppressed having fewer number of activities compared to those who were unsuppressed. So we've, as I just mentioned, the frequency of encounters was not associated with viral load suppression at month 12 compared to frequency of activities, suggesting that maybe frequency of activities may be a better measurement of intervention dosage than frequency of encounters. And we also found that higher frequency of activities was not associated with viral load suppression in the expected direction in the sense that we were hoping that individuals who were unsuppressed would have actually lower number of activities, but in the findings, we, they actually had higher uh, number of activities. And we believe that the, the reason for this unexpected findings is that individuals who were unsuppressed were, probably had more challenges and needs that prevented them from reaching viral suppression and that the case manager intervention by itself is not enough to help those individuals to reach viral load suppression and therefore more comprehensive interventions such as the HPTN096 that was mentioned earlier by Dr. Lauren Nelson and, and many others would be a better strategy to help reach viral load suppression among individuals who have more challenges. I would like to acknowledge the HPTN Scholars Program for accepting me this year. I had applied a few years before and I wasn't accepted, so I'm very happy to have been accepted this year. And thank uh, my mentor, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Dr. Chris Bear, for helping me out very much in conceptualizing this project as well as carrying out the, um, in the study, as well as the Teresa Gamble, James, and many others. I also would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Laura Nelson for helping me with making the connection for this program this year. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. That's terrific, Donaldson. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Chichi Chiti Bualya. And Doc, uh, Mr. Bualya is a research coordinator at the Maryland Global I Initiative Cooperation in, Zam in Zambia has his MPH from the University of Western Cape in South Africa, and he is going to start his PhD studies at the University of Maryland uh, just, just a few miles from here uh, this fall. Uh, take that experience back, to, back, back home to Zambia. So he's going to be talking about the HPTN 071 pop art trial in Zambia and South Africa, particularly uh, the experience of what are what were called the community-based HIV service providers. The nickname of that was CHIPS, if you recall. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, my name is Chiti, and I'm from Zambia. Uh, my presentation will focus on really looking at uh, experiences of uh, community health workers that delivered the pop-up intervention in Zambia and South Africa. Oh, sorry. All right, so as we all know, uh, universal test and treat has the ability to reduce HIV incidence at population level. And when we deliver this approach uh, using a door-to-door -door approach, we can optimize you know, how we reach uh, households and community members. But the use of um, you know, a door-to-door -door approach in my setting where I come from can be challenging because we've got very few healthcare workers. So the use of uh, community health workers is an alternative that can really help us to deliver universal test and treat. While we know that community health workers are very, very helpful, and we've seen them do magical things, we know very little about the experiences of delivering universal test and treat interventions door to door. So my study really, uh, like, like mentioned earlier on, was nested within the HPTN 071 pop art trial, uh, which was conducted in Zambia and South Africa and was trying to measure the effect of a door-to-door -door delivered UTT intervention on HIV incidence. And like mentioned earlier on, the trial recruited uh, community health workers who were also known as community HIV care providers that provided the UTT intervention by going door-to-door -door, testing everybody and linking those that were testing positive to care. So to understand the experiences uh, we nested in this trial, a longitudinal qualitative study where we followed up community health workers to actually understand the experiences. What we were trying to do with this uh, qualitative inquiry was to really understand 
what is it that they did, what were their role, and also what was the influence of the physical and social context uh, that existed in these communities. And then we also try to understand how did they navigate any challenges emanating from the physical and social context, and then teased out lessons for UTT um, expansion across Sub-Saharan Africa. So this slide just shows you the methodology that we use to really get an understanding of these experiences of community health workers, which was, like I mentioned earlier, on a qualitative inquiry. And we did observations, focus group discussions, and interviews with the different uh, community health workers that participated in the delivery of UTT services. And to do the analysis of our data, we use the job demands and resources model. So really, uh, this framework was used to help us categorize uh, two different things. The job demands, which we classified as the day-to-day -day activities that community health workers did to deliver UTT. And this included things like going uh, into the community, testing, providing counseling, linking people to ART, et cetera, et cetera. And then the job resources were classified as anything that motivated these community health workers us to keep on uh, you know, going to provide uh, the services uh, each and every day. And then using the, this model, we were trying to see is if there was a, um, a difference or an imbalance between the job demands and also the job resources. So what did we find? So what we found was that there was uh, a bit of fluidity in the roles that these community health workers played. And there was a difference between what was stipulated as the way, the way they were supposed to do their work, uh, stipulated in the POPAD protocol, and how they actually did their work. And we found that there were quite a number of factors that really made this difference between the intended roles and the actual roles. So one of the things that we saw was the influence of uh, physical identities. As you know, uh, these communities where the POPAD trial was implemented were very big communities, and community health workers or chiefs who are required to work every day to go and uh, provide the services. In addition to that, um, at times there were adverse weather events uh, which made the job a little bit difficult. So for example, when it's raining or when it's cold, it made community health workers to uh, you know, do their job in a, in a different way. Then the second thing that we see is the issue of social identities. So community health workers were recruited from within and also from outside these communities. So there was that issue of inside and outside identity that may have, that actually influenced how they delivered the service. A community health worker coming from within the community, especially in South Africa, uh, had challenges of providing HIV testing because people feared disclosure. They didn't want to be tested by somebody they know. And then also the issue of uh, an intersection between gender, race, and cultural identities. So for example, in Zambia, a community health worker was young and female, talking about med uh, medical male circumcision or STIs or even condom use was interpreted by the household members as disrespectful. In South Africa, a woman who uh, would go to a household to talk about uh, medical male circumcision was also interpreted as being disrespectful. Then we also see that um, job demands were also made difficult by the fact that the community health workers were not trusted at the beginning of the trial, especially in year one, and then stigma, alcohol, mobility, and also missing men also made the job demands of these community health workers uh, harder. Then we also see that most or some of them, or the community perceived community health workers as being HIV positive, which made it difficult for them to provide the service because being visited by someone who they think is HIV positive makes other households to be scared that, you know, people that see them being visited will assume they are HIV. HIV positive. Then we also see uh, study design factors that made it difficult for these community health workers to provide a service, which includes within POPART we had so many sub, sub studies, so there was a bit of confusion for the community health workers as well as the household members uh, that were being visited. So despite the job demands are creating a bit of challenges for these community health workers, we also saw a lot of job resources, like I mentioned earlier on, the motivators, the, the things that gave these community health workers the energy to keep on going. And, and these included, the, one, um, being a community health worker or a chief had a personal, positive personal impact on, on, the, on the person. So we also see that community health workers had an elevated community status. They were respected. 
uh, in the communities. Then also there were good supervision structures that were set up, and then also successively testing someone for HIV and linking them to care was a motivator for most community health workers. Then lastly, we also see that the design of the intervention was flexible as it allowed community health workers to think on their feet. So then, what does this mean? So basically what we're trying to say here is that job demands were more, slightly more than job resources, and this may have been created by the fact that uh, these communities, the social and physical context existing in these communities may have made it difficult for community health workers to provide a service. We also note that uh, flexibility and responsiveness in the design of UTT services is important. Then what are the implications for uh, future scale up of UTT across Sub-Saharan Africa? So when we design these programs, we need to make sure that we balance up the job demands and job resources. We, need, we, we shouldn't give too much work for community health workers. Then understanding of the physical and social context where we will implement this program is really, really important. Community engagement is key. And then also we need to integrate the social identities into the recruitment process of community health workers to improve acceptability and then performance up appraisals that focuses on well-being of community health workers than the numbers or the people they attend to should be embraced. And lastly, safety, especially in South Africa, should be taken into consideration. These are my, uh, this is my last slide. I would like to thank my mentors, Dr. Bond and also Dr. Msonda for their support. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good job. Excellent. Before we call on our last speaker, um, we're going to have about nine minutes for Q&A. So if you have a question, the mics are in, sort of in the middle here across the room. So keep that in mind. And uh, when you ask your question, tell us who you are, where you're from, and keep the question brief because we'll only have nine minutes. Then we're going to have an announcement from Mike Cohen. And I don't know if that's exactly the same as the surprise that, uh, that, that was mentioned by Wafa earlier. But in any case, our last speaker is uh, Nomta Bell Mandla. Um, Nomta is a public health and HIV researcher at Stellenbosch University uh, in, uh, outside of Cape Town. Uh, she managed the implementation of the HPTN 071 Pop Art Population Cohort. And in fact, that is the topic of her research predictors of participant, participant retention in that cohort. <laughs> Thank you, breath of fresh air. Um, hi, um, I'll be presenting um, my study titled predictors of participant retention in an HIV prevention trial population cohort uh, with data from the POPAR trial. And um, again, I'm affiliated with Stellenbosch University. Yes, and I think again in the last decade or so, uh, there have been many significant advances in the field of HIV um, management and prevention. However, we still have far too many people living with HIV globally, majority of, with, of which are residing in Eastern and Southern Africa. So there's still tremendous scope to continue with innovations to strengthen HIV prevention interventions in these high burden settings. And hence, the um, the statistical strength um, and the need to continue collecting data through longitudinal studies inclusive of randomized control trials and community randomized trials as well as observational cohort studies to provide this key evidence. However, these studies have often met with uh, challenges with uh, long follow-up periods and uh, retention of uh, part participants as well as recruitment challenges. This attrition um, is often having quite um, severe impacts on study validity and statistical strength of outcomes. I did this study because there were gaps in literature on identifying which uh, parts of targeted populations were more, more vulnerable to retention losses. Also identifying what were the determinants of these losses how to measure um, the effects of implemented strategies and how to consistently uh, measure outcomes across various um, studies in the available literature. 
In this study, we aim to evaluate the association between sex and other baseline characteristics. The baseline characteristics that we um, assessed were age, um, socioeconomic status, employment status, sexual behavior, um, alcohol and drug use, as well as marital status and retention in pop-up population cohort implemented in both Zambia and South Africa. I, uh, we hypothesized that sex would be a primary predictor of retention of research participants in the study, and we also hypothesized that females were more likely to be retained than males in this longitudinal study. Our question was, what is the association between sex and baseline characteristics and retention of these participants in the study. Bearing in mind that this study was implemented through the uh, POP Art 071 population cohort, our research design was um, implemented through indi individual level cohort study design and we included a sample which comprised of PC participants who had consented to participation into the population cohort and who had completed a survey. We measured uh, the primary outcome through univariate and multivariate regression models with poison regression at each annual round. And secondary outcome was measured through proportions and counts of um, retention outcomes as well as missed visits and uh, reasons behind uh, termination outcomes. Our findings were as follows. So um, through this study, we were able to identify the following variables to be predictors of um, participant retention. Sex, with females being more likely to be retained than males, age, with individuals being older than 35, more likely to be retained than those younger than 35, which were 18 to 34. Marital status, with those married and living as married being more likely to be retained than those not married. Socioeconomic status, with those with a higher socioeconomic status being more likely to be retained than those with medium and lower socioeconomic status. HIV status through lab outcomes, with those um, HIV negative being more likely to be retained than those who were, who were living with HIV. Self-report HIV status, with those individuals who had self-reported living with HIV and being registered in care being more likely to be retained than those who were living with HIV and not in care. However, the following variables did not have a significant association with retention outcomes that those were sexual behavior, employment status, alcohol and drug use. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> and um, through secondary um, outcome analysis, we were able to, um, to uh, summarize that we were able to successfully retain over 67% of the sample and um, with the 32% that were not retained, majority of which was comprised of individuals who uh, we had collected um, an outcome that we defined as missed visits, meaning that there was still an expectation to be able to um, conclude and, um, and complete study activities with those individuals. However, during the period of the annual round, these efforts, uh, the efforts of um, research teams were not successful. And again, seeing this in the context of, um, there were quite a lot of retention strategies implemented. We did contact tracing, we did um, community mobilizations, and um, we also did the implementation of shifts uh, during weekends and after hours to reach these participants. And amongst those that had um, communicated that they would not be able to continue with study engagements in future, we termed on dis and described those as study terminations, majority of which were because of relocation out of community.
So um, during the implementation of the study, we were able to identify higher at risk groups um, to retention losses. These were amongst individuals that were never married, males, HIV status, uh, those living with HIV, um, and younger adults, as well as individuals within the lower socioeconomic status. Again, relocation turned out to be quite a significant uh, barrier to uh, the completion of study activities. And in the, in, in the implementation of the study, um, household disclose, disclosure amongst participants as well as community disclosure of those individuals living with HIV, um, accompanied by positive rapport with researchers, um, turned out to support retention. For future um, studies, we'd recommend that there be uh, population-specific retention strategies to retain men, younger adults, individuals within the lower socioeconomic status, people living with HIV, those individuals never married um, in longitudinal follow-up studies. And that these targeted population retention strategies be implemented at recruitment and during study implementation and um, in the context of the population study, um, funny enough, intention to relocate out of catchment was a question uh, that we asked during the study inclusion criteria. And all the participants that were included had responded that they had no intention of relocating. So we learned that this was quite an unpleasant surprise and it requires a significant consideration um, in future study planning. I would like to thank my study mentors, Ayana Moore and Professor Bock, as well as the support of the scholarship program and the network. Thank you. Good job. Thank you very much. All right. We do have a few uh, uh, moments for questions. And as you start thinking about yours and coming to the mic, I'll just uh, kick it off. And let me ask Ade. What considerations should be made when engaging persons who experience uh, IPV uh, while not jeopardizing their personal safety? This comes up a lot uh, in uh, marginalized communities where just our studying them could theoretically put them at risk. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's a... Uh, it's sort of the ultimate question with the, with the research, right? How do you um, engage those who are experiencing IPV while not jeopardizing um, their partners finding out or things like that? I think asking those questions generally um, within different settings, so healthcare settings or where you're engaging folks, because um, we don't really integrate um, questions around IPV or questions around sort of other determinants of HIV within testing or treatment programs. So I think first we have to ask to know that it's occurring and then we really have to um, talk with the community or with those who are experiencing these things about the best ways to um, engage them rather than imposing what we think would work for them. And I don't know that we are at that point in the research where we really know what works. So at the risk of sounding like any scientist and saying we need more research, we do need more research. <laughs> fair, um, fair to enough. really figure out the elements that, that, the, that would sort of drive um, best engagement of the community. Okay, thank you. Hello and thanks for the presentation. I'm Ariane van der Straten. I'm the chair of the SBS working group, Niche PTN at UCSF and ASTRA. Um, I have two questions. One for um, Ade, um, you um, showed the association between IPV and substance and alcohol use. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought about the fact that it might be a reverse association and that it's not a mitigating um, uh, or coping mechanism, but it's the substance use that is perhaps promoting IPV and I think it would uh, potentially lead to different types of intervention. And then my next question. Let, let's do one at a time. OK, okay. go ahead, Adi. We, we did think about that, and which is why we decided to isolate um, the IPV measure to just baseline to allow for some temporality with 
um, substance use over time. But we do believe there might be a bi-directional relationship between the two of them. And then the next question was for Donaldson about the case management, uh, the case manager. I think it was really interesting how you found a reverse association from your uh, hypothesis. I was wondering if you had any qualitative data that were collected that would actually substantiate or give you some insights that indeed those who are not virally suppressed um, have other social and um, social needs and other challenges that the case management may not be uh, able to address. Um, and any comments on that? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. We did, in fact, have qualitative data supporting uh, that individuals who were unsuppressed did have more challenges related to housing and other issues that could not be addressed through the case manager intervention. So thank you very much. Thanks. Good. Dr. St. Ville is also online, so if we have a question for her, please. Thank you. I'm Jessica Justman. I'm with uh, ICAP at Columbia. Um, my question uh, is primarily for NOMTA, but really I think a number of folks may have thoughts on this. Um, I certainly was struck by and not surprised that many participants first said they had no intention of relocating, but then they, in fact, did relocate. I mean, that that's life. Life happens. Things happen. And it just makes me think, especially with all of our experience with the pandemic, that we can perhaps plan for this not just with um, retention measures that focus at, on people who are likely to be difficult to be retained, but thinking about ways to conduct more televisits, um, virtual visits, especially for people who relocate. And I think all of us at sites already try to do a lot of this um, as creatively as we can and fly people in and so on. But I think either for specific studies or even as a network, if we can think more and more about using virtual visits, um, especially in that context of relocation, it would help us with our retention numbers. So it's a bit of a comment and question looking for reactions. OK. Um, Yes, I fully agree that uh, post-COVID, we've definitely grown in our abilities to engage virtually. And I think it's um, definitely some lessons that we can uh, bring into uh, study engagements with participants. And um, at the time of study implementation, which was a good couple of years before COVID, uh, we had not thought that far. But I think um, in this day and time, it is definitely um, alternatives that we should explore. Thank you. May yes, please. Good afternoon. My name is Jared Hahn. I'm from Rutgers Research at the Heart in North New Jersey. I was going to ask Mr. Grawley, but anyone can answer if they like. I see often that, especially when it comes to community health workers, they're constantly underpaid and not paid enough and overworked, as you explained. What can we do in the research community to help make it a standard for sponsors to pay for those roles, pay enough for them, so we're not just saying, oh, well, we're paying you in good intentions. You you're doing this because of the goodness of your heart. Because I personally believe that if we pay them more, it won't take away from the good deeds they're doing. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we constantly said they're pivotal, but we don't pay for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That's a very interesting and difficult question to answer at the same time. Um, so as we know, um, the idea behind community health workers is the volunteer aspect of their job and that they are supposed to help the communities where they live in. Uh, the issue of, of what we pay them comes up all the time when, when, when we interview them or have a discussions with them. Uh, so I think what is important is to really strike the balance between what are the economic prevailings in, in the communities where they live and at the same time not take away the volunteer aspect of, of their job. Because what is really, really important is the fact that these are supposed to be, the, the whole definition, the whole a concept of community health work is supposed to be somebody who loves their community and is able to give their time and one work and help their communities. So we need to strike a balance between what can we give them and what can we do to make sure that you know they're, they're still able to sustain themselves while it's working for our different programs. Thank you. 
Yes, and if I can uh, briefly add, because uh, the POPA trial was implemented in both Zambia and South Africa. In South Africa, we had, in the middle of the study, identified that there was a gap uh, with wow. a lot of, uh, of, of our community-based workers uh, going through a lot of uh, social um, barriers to um, really doing their work as well as they would have liked to. So yeah. we, um, we added um, additional resources, such as um, psychosocial support, at, uh, that would come to the communities where they lived and have a group and individual sessions as well as um, mobilize to get um, training rec resources so that w those who were willing to grow into maybe um, a broader career options would consider that at the end of the trial. Thanks. There are a lot more questions and I have some myself that I'll ask you in our session this afternoon. But I want to thank all the speakers and call on Mike Cohen to uh, both end this session and make his announcement. Well, th thanks, uh, Sven. Thanks for the great session. We survived an entire morning together as homo sapiens. Um, and now we must be fed, um, and so, so fed and watered. And so there, there will be lunch outside. Well, as, as we discussed earlier, we're trying to create the safest possible environment, so we'd really like you to wear your mask while you collect your lunch, and then try and find a commodious place to eat, either outside, there's a courtyard in your room, on the street, whatever, you know, like we're trying to keep, <laughs> trying to keep people away from each other to try and reduce the probability of, of transmission events. One thing, one thing that has happened this year is normally when we've had a success as big as our Cabotegravir studies, uh, 083 and 084, we would have had a party. Obviously, since COVID is compromising our ability to have a party, but we felt that we needed to do something to uh, recognize the teams, all of you in this room who contributed to that study. So you'll see outside instead a very American tradition, a cupcake. Cupcakes are extremely, you see how heavy we are. Cupcakes are very popular. But we have these very special cupcakes that say 083 and 084 on them with a box for you to put your cupcake in. I would suggest you choose whether you want to do a woman's cupcake or a men's cupcake. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure they'll taste any different. Well, I guess you can hear that later. But really enjoy these cupcakes. And let's have a round of applause for the team that, that, that did this. So, in, in, enjoy your lunch and your cupcake. And I think we have a thousand cupcakes or something, so you know, be sure to take your cupcake. <laughs>